All right, that's it. Uh, first of all, I want to say thanks for coming on. Um, I know um, uh, you're probably a busy, dude. I mean, you still are. You still the what? You're the assistant director of deputy, ahead, your, deputy director deputy. of management, homeland security. Wow, Here are that's awesome. It sounds yeah. cool, but it's not. <laughs> well, you being a humble guy, I'm sure it's a little more cooler than you are leading on, but. Um, it, I mean, I, I read that article you were, um, I think it was in the local paper that there was like a power outage and, you know, you were instrumental in getting in there and, and, uh, finding solutions and getting every kind of corralling everybody and, you know, water outage outage. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. What water, I said power. Yeah, water. Broke that really, uh, paralyzed the entire city, which was, you know, you wouldn't think water would paralyze yeah. the city. Uh, water does so much that I didn't even realize it do, does, you know, like, yeah, you, and you can't even have a hospital open without constant flow of water. Right. Right. And, and a lot of big, big businesses, that's how they cool their um, computers and things like that. So uh, you, I didn't know that. Well, yeah, I do. No. Know. I, I do you now. take it for granted. Yeah. Like you said, you take yeah. it for granted. You don't think about it. You know, you think just electricity is probably the biggest thing, but yeah. It, well, and water, so you had them up and running. It was like, was it less than 24 hours? It was like well, 18 hours or something. So the whole event was about four days. Okay. But um, we had to bring water in. And you, know, you don't think about it, but just to be able to fight fires. So if a fire broke out, how would we even fight fires? So right. we had to bring um, tanker trucks in from the entire region. We had to bring, we, get, we handed out in those four days a half a million bottles of water. Jeez. And then we had to figure out ways to manage what water flow there was and pump it to those hospitals so they wouldn't have to close. Um, and oh, to those yeah. businesses, because the businesses now it's not just affecting the local area, but you're talking about, you know, large parts of the country when it was insurance companies and things like that. So, yeah, I learned a lot during that event. <laughs> I'll bet. Sure. Yeah, I wouldn't even know because, I mean, you just like I kind of said before, you take it for granted that the, the water just goes where it's supposed to go. Yep. So you have to figure out a way to get that external tank into that system and get it diverted. And, and a lot of them are closed systems. So there was no way for us to bring a tanker full of water in and do it. So then you have to work with the water company to try and say, okay, well, prioritize putting your water in this area. So this business can work for a little while and then, okay, let's move it over here. And they were very, um, cooperative and uh, you know wanting to keep everything going so oh nice but, yeah we this is a great area for uh first responders and stuff they they do an awesome job they they cooperate which is unusual apparently i didn't you know <laughs> i wouldn't know any different because i've only ever done it here so but right um, the fact that they cooperate with each other so much and work with each other so easily um it, it, it made my job a whole lot easier yeah, from that article, it seemed like everybody was just kind of jiving and, you know, yeah. kind of leaning so, forward to help each other instead of. As you already know, with me, um, <clears throat> the boss is the dumbest person in the room, as long as you have a great staff, <laughs> <laughs> as long as you, you have great people. And I've been fortunate to always have great people on my team. So um, that's a, and that's so a sign I'm of a good be, leader. Surround and so I can be the dumbest person in the room and, and still succeed. <laughs> <laughs> It's because you're uh, number one, a, a good manager, but also more importantly, you're a good leader. You know, people just you, people just want to follow you, man. And that kind of that that leads us into our talk. I mean, that's I I first of all, I want to say thank you for coming on, but also I want to say thanks you thank you for everything you did for me in my career. I mean, I wouldn't have gotten anywhere without you know yours and you know especially yours, but guys like you and Kenny Lindsay, you know, being there right at the beginning of my career. I say beginning, but like. I had that first part. And then once we get, once I got to the 17th, it was like it, kind of my, that's when my career kind of started, you know, like I, I, I want to say and I without you guys, same, I think that? the same thing. Set, my career really never started till I got to the 17th. Yeah. Right. You know, it's, it's such a and I had probably had a lot to do with the war. Don't you think? It well, it's a, it's a different world. You know, even when yeah. I was there the first time, um, it's just, you, you do, so much more than everybody else does you learn right. so much more you're exposed to so much more than yeah. everybody else did so um i mean you just excel so fast 
compared to your peers that are in other units, right. which I think, you know, they've closed that gap a little bit with training and stuff, which is good. Oh yeah. Across the board makes uh JTAGs, tag P's more universal. So that's a For good sure. thing. <clears throat> yeah. They stood up that, um, that FTU or whatever down in, in Texas. And now there's mm-hmm. kind of like pipeline through all the way to JTAC. So yeah, yeah. It, it helps out immensely. Yep. Well, that's, that's so, good. Well, so speaking of that, let's back up a little bit. Um, w- tell me about, we can go back as far as you want, but I, I've always, I, I, I was thinking about you the other day and I was thinking about, you know, I never really knew like your background before, the 17th. Like I kind of knew, like, I remember when I went to jump master school, I remember mm-hmm. seeing you, you were like, you had a Gentex and, uh, uh, we were like, like um, fixing. I kind of lost you a little bit. You're frozen on me. Okay. I lost video for a second. Um, but anyway, you got What's gobbled that? up on my end, so I must have had a bad signal. So okay. Everything you said um, about before the 17th, I, I, you garbled up after that. Okay. So I was thinking, um, uh, well, what I said was before the 17th, I didn't really real, I didn't really know, I guess, what you did before that, before I mean, you came back to the, back to the Rangers. Before I came um, back I, to the 17th. Yeah, yeah. I do remember yeah. seeing you. Um, I went through jump master school. I had I went to the 18th ASOG jump master school, and I think you were either a cadre or you were around doing something. And um, I remember uh, you were fixing your Gentex. Your your the comma wasn't working or something. And I just remember you. Um, you probably don't remember this because you're you're the you know it was just one of those run of the mill things. But if to me coming from a, a unit that wasn't like um, uh, kind of in the loop like you were. Um, Mm-hmm. I was like, oh man, look at that dude. He's over there fixing his, cause I think you were free fall at the time. So you're like, you had a free fall helmet and you're like, you know, so that, that, that's my first, I think that's my first exposure to you. You were like that dude that was like, oh man, I would be like that guy. Um, wow, you but so, like so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what did I know? I didn't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I started off um, at Bragg um, with the 80, 82nd, that one at the 82nd. Um, and then um, did about four years there. And I left there and I went down to uh, third ranger battalion. Um, so that's the first time I was at the 17th. And then okay. after I left, and the first time I was at the uh, third ranger battalion is when I went to Panama and jumped into Panama and stuff like that too. Um, right. <clears throat> so when I left there, I was, uh, that's the time when they wanted to, uh, share the the joy i guess of making sure that uh airborne guys went to remote units as well so i was one of the first guys to get tagged for korea from from a unit like uh, the rangers and so i went to korea for a year Uh, when i came back from there i wanted to go back to the rangers but there wasn't any opening positions so they sent me back to bragg where i was with the 22nd ace off right right. I'm not sure that's if that's when we first met when I was with the 22nd ace off or not. Uh, that might've been, yeah, that might've been that when you were, you, I was, were pro- you were probably I just augmenting the, the course or something. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, then I went back to the 17th again. Yep. So let's, uh, now that we're doing that, let's go. So after the 17th, you were, uh, you were there for a long time. Um, and then where'd you go from there? Like, tell me that, that way, so, well, let's go all the way through your career and then we'll, we'll back up to. Okay. The- so after the 17th, um, you know, I, I was a master sergeant and it was just mm-hmm. time for me. They, they wanted me to move on, you know, from the 17th, right. even though I didn't necessarily want to move on from the 17th. So, <laughs> nobody does, man. <laughs> nobody does. Right? I know. <laughs> Which is why we all can't walk today. We can't, you know, hardly <laughs> right. move. My ankles are hurting right now. Yeah, exactly. And, My knees. Know, you know, all that time at the 17th, it cost you. Um, so, um, but it was worth it. I'd do it all over again. For sure. And I'd probably fill in the gaps if I could, you know. Right. So from there, uh, I got an assignment uh, at uh, a joint assignment at uh, Langley um, at uh, ACC headquarters. I had a joint assignment there as a joint CAS, joint close air support. Um. And uh, while I was there, I made senior and, and then I also made chief. 
And so uh, from there, then they sent me to Fort Campbell. Okay. Um, it was at Campbell and then from Campbell to the Pentagon. Okay. And did you, uh, is that where you ended up? Or is that where you retired I'm, out of? I'm oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. I keep cutting you off. I, I, that was another assignment. I tried to avoid the Pentagon assignment. So. <laughs> I, 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 man, it's just the nature of you being who you are and being so sought after and good at your job. I mean, it was kind of inevitable that they put you at the Pentagon and you're the career field manager, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. what I ended so up. You, yeah. yeah. Career field I mean, yeah, I, like tried I, said, not to, <laughs> I, I actually, the funny, it's they, funny make, thing they make guys like you do it, man. You're so good. Yeah. They, they called me in for an interview and I said, well, I, I really don't want to do that. And, and then I was kind of told by the group commander at the time, they're like, uh, chief, you don't understand. You are going to go do that. So I'm like, okay. So I went up and I thought I blew the interview. You know, I, I, it was a three-star I interviewed with and I thought I blew the interview because, you know, basically saying everything that I thought needed to be fixed. Right. So um, you don't usually insult people's programs. Right. <laughs> right. right. Uh, so I get back and it like, a week later, hey, guess what? You're going to the you know, Pentagon. I'm like, uh, no, I'm not. I'm going to retire. There's no way. They're like, uh, you don't understand. You're going to the Pentagon. I'm like, oh my God. No, I'm going to retire. They're like, you don't understand, Chief. You're <laughs> going to the Pentagon, period. And so, guess where I was at the Pentagon? <laughs> How was that? Um, was I mean, you, you know, did a lot of good stuff up there, though. I remember you, there was, I mean, like you there said, there was a lot of change. There was a lot of change at foot when I got there. So I kind of walked into a lot of change. You know, the, the guys that were there before me and stuff, they did a lot of great work. Um, and they laid the groundwork for a lot of change in our career field. Yeah. Um, so I kind of walked into some change. I remember one of my first days there, I had a two star walk up to me and didn't even introduce herself, just said, Hey, I'm moving your schoolhouse to, uh, 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 Texas. I'm like, first of all, who are you? You know, <laughs> yeah, you know I, I, I mean, that was the first things out of her mouth was, uh, Hey, I'm moving to schoolhouse to Texas. And the next thing out of her mouth was, and you're not doing anything about it. I'm like, uh, okay. So I'm all like, right. welcome to the Pentagon. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and so, and I, I you know, there's, the, a lot of things were already in motion that were not going to be stopped. Um, yeah. But, you know, you just try and embrace it and, and make the best of it. And I think, it, you know, even though everybody resistant to it at first, it worked out pretty good, you know. Oh, I, I for her, a hundred percent. I'm pretty happy yeah. with it now. Um, and, you know, we were working with a lot of folks. Then we were trying to transition the career field at the time from the old ways to, mm -hmm. you know, a, a new, smarter way of doing things. Yeah. Um, I think you guys okay. did. I think it's way better now. It just seemed like on Herbert, Herbert, it was, there was no room to expand. And it seemed like we yeah. were like, stepping on all the soft guys toes. And, you know, it was like, it, it just seemed well, logical. To putting me. everybody together though, you can consolidate a lot of the training. And I think sure. it gave, I think it gave our guys a lot more opportunity to train better and train smarter. Definitely. Um, we, uh, when I was at the Pentagon, we, we were, and as you know, very well, I mean, by the time you were a tech sergeant, uh, you were broken. Everybody, I'm not talking, you know, JD, I'm talking everybody, every JTAG. Right. They were broken, yeah. they, you know, they have massive injuries. They were burned out uh, from deploying constantly. Um, and when you did but deploy, it wasn't like, you know, you got to s sit on your laurels at all. You went out and went out and went out and went out and went out. Yeah. So, there was a lot of issues with that sort of thing. So we had to figure out a way to overcome that because at that point in time, you know, it didn't look like the war was going to end anytime soon. Right. Uh, so you, you really had to figure out a way to um, sustain your resources. And the main resource being those people. And, right. you know, the best way of course is to get more. Right. But, you know, it, it's not as everybody still knows, it's not a, an easy course. So you get a lot of right. people watching and you, and you don't create a JTAC overnight. Um, so uh, you just had to come up with creative ways to do that. And part of the issue was you still had the folks that liked it the old way, you know, yeah. but, uh, but there are smarter ways to do things. And I think when we merged and went down to uh, Lackland, uh, 
we learned a lot smarter ways to do business and not, and, sure. not and not um, destroy our folks uh, ourselves, you know, and f- yeah. figure out a way to sustain them through an entire career. So they're not burned out and they're not all injured at, you know, by the time they're a tech sergeant. Right. So I, I, I kind of see those things come to fruition now, which is good. Um, yeah. Taking the, everything moves a little slower, but uh, there's been some great leaders in the career field. Mm-hmm. Well, for me too, I've been out a long time now, so yeah. it's been a lot of change. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good point. I mean, back when we were doing it, it was just like, you just go and you just suck it up and, Oh, you got an injury. Well, we don't have anybody to replace you. So just gotta do it again. Figure it out, you know, and hold on. I lost you again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, but yes, yeah. oh, we got a lot smarter about our equipment too. You know, uh, when, when yeah. I was an airman, you know, we made 150 pounds worth of radios you carried in your backpack, plus the, you know, the KY right. gear, the KY gear. And you know, it was just kind of funny to me whenever I was at the Pentagon and I had the young guys complaining about they had to carry one radio that did everything that those 150 pounds of radios did. You know, I'm like, <laughs> wow, dude, <laughs> if I could take yeah. you back. <laughs> I know. Like each 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 uh, frequency band had its own radio. You know, you had a 113, yeah, you had right. UHF, UHF, yeah. and then you had a, a 77, yeah. you know, that did FM and the 104. The, did, the best radio was the 66, and, yeah. you know, it only weighed a little bit, but, you know. It, oh, right, right. It, it oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. Yeah, it was a lot of weight to carry around. Yeah. Um, for sure. But And we weren't prepared for it back then. Yeah. You know, we just didn't, we didn't uh, train smartly. Uh, yeah. We didn't do physical fitness smartly like they do now, which is good. Right. Yeah. They, yeah. they, they do it in a way to build you up instead of break you down. seems like. You know? Yes. And to build you up, to sustain you. Right. right. So we, you know, we weren't that smart. That's all we knew though. Yeah. I'm not, not going to mention names, but I still laugh about this all the time. Uh, certain somebody when we were on an ops course, you know, we used to do stupid stuff all the time when we did PT, but on an ops course that couldn't run up over that wooden uh, slanted thing and wanted to keep running through it. Yeah. <laughs> you remember I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think we all had more exercise laughing. Oh, I haven't laughed that hard in a long time, man. <laughs> that was like, like, come on. Uh, you know what else I was thinking of? I thought you were going to bring this up, but I was also thinking of when we did that confidence course and, uh, you always had that, that shoulder that would pop out oh, yeah. and, um, you like, you jumped and you are like, you were getting ready. We had to get you over this water and we were just yanking on your arms and you're like, and, uh, I think we pulled it out of socket and you and just both, you went over to the side. Go ahead. Yeah. You guys have pulled them both out of socket, <laughs> but then you're yelling at me because I'm like, hurry up and get across me. You're using me as a bridge, and I'm thinking, my arms are out of socket, guys. <laughs> but we got across. Yeah, and then we kept going. You kept going. I don't know yeah. they popped back in or what, but you just, yeah. we all, you kept going. And, yeah. Popped out about six times. I had a few surgeries <laughs> since then, but um, oh, yeah. I still can't. This arm, this is as far as it goes. I, I cannot lift it up any higher than that right there. Uh, but, Man. you know, hey, I, like I said, I'd do it all over again. Yeah, for sure. But okay, so let's um let's reset. Let's go back to the beginning. Not the okay. very beginning. You can if you want. But um, what I am really interested in, and I and I was thinking about this the other day. Also, I ne- we never really sat down. I think we talked a little bit about. And if you don't feel comfortable, it's, I understand. But um, I, we only talked a little bit about your operation just cause. Like we like you mentioned a couple of things. You didn't talk that much about it. Um, and if like I said, if it's, if it's hard to talk about, we don't have to. But I always found it interesting that there was guys like you that, you know, that nobody ever even knew was there. You know, they just they heard Rangers jumped in in 82nd and, you know, some SEALs were there. But then and they forget that guys like you were, you know, instrumental in that operation, you know, doing good things. And I don't know if you wanted to, like, t- tell, take us from when you first yeah. found out you were going to, you know. I'll be glad to. So that back then we were ETAX, right? And so. Right. We were also very unusual, just like the you know seventeenth is today, um, and the, throughout the career field, we were very unusual then too. We you know one ETAC per company that was unheard of, 
Um, so yeah. I was, a, I was aligned with the Bravo company, third battalion. Um, and that's who I was aligned with the whole time I was there at the first time. Okay. Um, and, um, so we actually rehearsed, uh, invading Panama. It was like a year long of rehearsals. We were practicing all the different places to go and, um, uh, all the different types of missions that we would do. I mean, they were building mock towers and different things like that. I remember on one time um, they wanted to put uh, myself and the fire support guys up in the top of a tower that they built out of scaffolding. And it was pretty high um, <laughs> and had to shimmy up to the top of that thing with all that heavy radio gear. You know, we didn't have, you know, the light stuff. Yeah. And for some reason on the way back down, I decided to go ahead and tie in, you know, you remember the old rope belts we used to, use oh, yeah. rope tie and sure enough i slipped and there i'm hanging upside down off of this scaffolding tower <laughs> thinking, man what am i doing you know <laughs> but you know you don't think about it but you know the funny thing is we rehearsed that for probably close to a year and every time you know i, I was supposed the first person i was always supposed to link up with was the fire the company fire support officer and we would never find each other until we got to our assembly point, you know, Yeah. Uh, never, ever. But when we yeah. jumped into power, we landed right next to each other. It was just kind of crazy. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. What are the odds? Yeah. But I remember, um, you know, we, it got delayed a couple of times cause they were trying to tie it in with, uh, everybody leaving at the same times, you know, or leaving in succession so that we would all get there at the same time. Right. Oh. Um, and, and the weather was real bad at Bragg. So the 82nd guys weren't able to take off and stuff like that. And I guess the decision was made some point or another for us to go ahead and take off. It was freezing at Fort Benning that, that day. Oh, really? It was pretty cold and rainy and wet and getting on, the, getting on the bird. And, um, and they didn't do a straight flight because they didn't want um, uh, Cuba to give us away. Uh, so they kind of went way out of the way, away from Cuba. Uh, as otherwise, you know, you would fly straight past Cuba. To sure. Go down there. Um, yep. So I, I think it was like an eight hour flight that, uh, so it was a long flight. But I remember. Did you guys, there. did you guys, were you rigged up or did you in-flight rig on the way there? We, we were rigged up already. <sighs> and so it was an eight hour flight rigged up. Oh my um, God. Everything, you were completely rigged up. And so you, you know, you remember how in one thirty, you know, you had your rucksack sitting on your knees and then the dude across from you is rucksack sitting on your knees too, you know? Um, and I was way Jeez. up in the front by the little windows. I was way up in the front yep. by the little windows. So it was packed in there tight. Um, oh my God. But, you know, and I, of course, you know, when you're in that position, you got to pee real bad, right? <laughs> of course. Um, of course. I Never think it was about three hours into it. They passed, they were passing around a piddle pack. And by the time it got to me, it was already overflowing, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> first of all, how did oh anybody gosh. pee in that thing when they're all rigged up the way they were? And <laughs> And I'm like, hell no, I'm not even going to touch that thing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I, I I remember I had like um, a JSOC surgeon on one side of me and I think it was a chaplain on the other side of me or something like that. So it was just an odd position to be in. Um, yeah. I, I remember looking around the, the aircraft and, and this will tie into something later, but I remember looking around the aircraft and seeing – all the guys. And I kept thinking, you know, I, I was 25 then. Um, and your average Ranger was, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old. I just kept sure. thinking, boy, I'm going, I'm going to war with a bunch of kids. Cause they looked right. like kids to me at that point, even though, you know, 25, I'm a kid too, basically. But to me, they looked like kids and I'm thinking, Holy crap, I'm going to war with a bunch of kids. Um, <laughs> but I still wouldn't want to go to war with anybody else other than Rangers. And that's been right. true ever for ever time. Um, but, um, that's, that's what was running through my mind was, man, just, they look like a bunch of kids, you know? Uh, so we get, you know, we get closer and, uh, it's coming time, you know, it's, they black out the aircraft and, and back then, you know, they didn't have the little blue lights that they had in the aircraft. Now they didn't, they right. didn't even have chem lights. They didn't light anything up with chem lights. And when it was blacked out, it was blacked out. I mean, you basically yeah. had to feel around to see the person in front of you, but, uh, the fact we were going pretty low and the fact that we had, um, I had, was up by the little windows. Uh, I could see outside, you know, so I could see the explosions when the one seventeens 
hit the um uh their targets yeah uh, so you knew you were close but let me back up a little bit when we were, let me back up a whole lot then so when we got <laughs> when we got recalled for the uh actual invasion uh, we were having our christmas party our unit christmas oh. party and and everybody was pretty much uh toasted at that point <laughs> and all of our pagers went off at once and oh, that's no. never a good thing right and so we right, all looked right. at each other okay it's time finally and you know everybody yeah, you've probably been waiting for like you know a year yeah, to do this it, thing so i knew it was coming we were expecting you know um yeah so here we are with all of our families and everything our girlfriends and everybody and and uh drunk as a skunk and all of our pagers go off we have one more shot to go and we all go into work uh drunk of course oh. Real quick, who all who all was there at the time? Like who 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 was who was it that you know all, all went with you? Um, so at the battalion, uh, Valella was in charge. Uh, we had uh, a couple alos, um, and forgive me for not remembering everybody's names. Sure, sure, uh, yeah, yeah. Banging my head too many times, I think. <laughs> um, and then uh, uh, Avance was at the battalion at the time, I think, and. Um, uh, K- uh, Kibby was there. Um, so, you know, there was only three enlisted and one at the battalion level and then two ALOs. So I'm pretty sure that's who we had at the it's battalion level. And then we had, you know, guys at the regiment too. But uh, sure, sure. So it was, it was a good team. Um, but uh, that's, you know, when we got, that's when I found out what a 117 was. When we got to our offices, they had laid a a, a, a folder on uh, Valella's desk, and it said top secret. Well, back then, none of us had top secret clearances. You know, that right, wasn't right. You just, they just didn't do that. Sure. And so we're all, we're all looking at each other like, uh, what's this about? And how much trouble are we going to get in? Because <laughs> we have a top secret <laughs> document sitting on the desk. And then one of the ALOs came in and said, Every, he, everybody needs to read this. Um, so... And then I read it, and that's when I—that's when I learned about a 117. I didn't even know there was a such thing. Before. Yeah, they're like brand new, but yeah, then yeah, they, that's right. Well, yeah, that's I guess right. they've been around for a while, but they hadn't—they had not. They Nobody didn't. knew about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, now going back into being in that aircraft, so you see, I see the explosions. You know, we're really low, um, and they're flying in just above the water, so they got to bump up to the jump altitude, um, which you- apparently. It, we only jumped bumped up to 450 feet. So that was my second 450 foot jump. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, but uh, so as we're coming in, um, you know, by the window and everybody's starting to do with their thing. And you, know, you can see the tracers going through the sky and all that stuff. And um, from what I understand later is we had actually had a couple of people shot in the aircraft. I remember stepping over people, um, I, but you know, it was like so dark, you really couldn't tell, you know, sure. the light, the light that you were getting was the ambient light from the ground at the door, you know? So I remember somebody hesitating in the door, a few people in front of me, and then um, they basically got pushed out of the aircraft. And I found out, somebody told me later that they were possibly shot while they were in the door or whatever. Oh so I'm, you know, I'm in that aircraft and the first the only thing i'm thinking about is i want to get out of this airplane i want to get out of this airplane get me out of this airplane because i'm like i don't want to crash right. and die in an airplane <laughs> you know <laughs> right and i jump out and there's tracers going everywhere all over the place and i'm thinking i want to get back in that airplane i gotta get back in that airplane. <laughs> yeah. and i just wanted to like but and, then, and a little bit of, i mean a 450 foot jump you don't have a lot of time right no you, I that's not managed i still managed to get my pistol out of we did have leg holsters i still managed to get it out of my leg holster and have it in my hand before i hit the ground because i'm thinking you know if there's somebody down there, i want to at least be able to shoot them because they they had us put our weapons inside the cases um and we were always told we would never do that but they did demonstrate that you can actually get it out of the case faster than you can if it's strapped to your side um so that's a good did i lose you jd you're frozen on me I may have lost you.
Do we need to re? I don't, we're frozen, so I don't know if I lost you or not, but I'm going to try and see what if I can redo this. Okay, sorry about that. Oh, okay. Uh, we I, I lost. I went, went squirrely for a minute. Yeah. So, how much did you hear? Okay, so I heard. Uh, I heard you. Um, it was four hundred fifty feet, but you still managed to, and then you cut off. Get my, uh, I still managed to get my pistol out of my leg holster. We had leg holsters. Now oh. we're probably the only people did. And because I'm thinking, I'm get on the ground. I want to be able to, you know. Oh, so you pulled it out in the I air. I pulled it out in the air. Nice, I managed to pull nice. it out in the air. <laughs> um, because we had our, our rifles in the cases, um, yeah. you know, we were always told before that you're always going to jump at exposed. If you jump into combat, you're not going to jump in the case, but they had demonstrated to us that you can actually get it out of the case faster than you For could sure. get, than you could get it off of your side, you know, cause when it's strapped in. So, but you know, I had my pistol out. Yeah, cause you had that quarter inch cotton webbing you had to tie off and you had a bunch yeah. of other stuff you had to do to jump at exposed. Yeah. It just seemed real yeah. cumbersome. It was. And so and they, I mean, everybody at first was like, oh, no, I'm going to jump mine exposed. Well, they demonstrated that. And so, we, you know, we were good. But um, so I landed in the worst possible place I can land. I landed in the middle of the runway. Um, oh, and there, there was this tracer fire going all over the place. And oh, I, I was laying on my back and my parachute was collapsed. It wasn't pulling on me or anything like that. But um, I, I was kind of nervous because the tracers were kind of like, right over me you know like within a foot going you know back and forth so i i didn't want to roll up or stand up or get anything like that and i don't you know i have a tendency to do dumb things was this probably one of the dumber things i've ever done <laughs> <laughs> um you know how many times have you gotten you jumped and you know you pull your cape wells and you're free of your parachute right mm -hmm. yeah no for some reason i totally forgot that step and i Broke out my, remember the old orange uh, switchblade knives? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yep. You can hot, hardly cut hot butter with. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> I took those and like in one swipe, cut myself out of my harness. <laughs> and I'm like, I had to be pure adrenaline to do that because. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, get through that thick, you know, webbing and everything. Uh, yeah. That knife. And, and, yeah, yeah. Like I said, you can't even cut warm butter with those knives normally. <laughs> right. And I just like sliced right through that sucker. So it had to be sheer adrenaline that got me through that. Oh, yeah. I got out of my parachute, got my stuff together. And um, the um, fire support officer had landed just off the runway. And right next to me. So he's right there. And nice. the funny thing I, I just remember, he's there's really tall grass. And so he's just standing up and putting his stuff together like it's, you know, like we did every exercise for the past year. You know, I'm thinking, what are you doing? And so I run over, I managed, there's a break in the shooting and I run over to the side and I'm like, Lieutenant, what are you doing? He goes, I'm getting my stuff together. I said, and you could hear the bullets going <laughs> all over. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, Sir, do you hear that? He's like, yeah, what is that? I said, those are bullets. <laughs> oh, my God. So then he kind of, you know, kind of sunk in, you know, like, oh, crap, you know. So we got <laughs> crap. You got, we got his stuff together, and uh, we started heading out to our assembly point. And um, we came – there was um, – America's One was a highway that ran right through Rio Hato that we jumped into Rio Hato. And there was an intersection right there. So there was a pretty good gunfight going on there. Well, unfortunately for us, our assembly area is on the other side of that intersection. Wow. 
and you know, so there was a lot of of uh, shooting going on and stuff like that. But there was a a ranger that was laying out. I mean, he was basically kind of sitting, um, and he was in the middle of all that, and he was just there, you know. And so there was a a couple medics. I think they were JSOC guys that were um, sitting there waiting, you know, because everybody's just kind of waiting for this firefight because you can't get past it because there was that much shooting going on right. and then um so i'm like i turned to the fire support officer i said we gotta go get we gotta go get that guy and he's like oh hell no we're not going out there and i said oh hell yeah we are and yeah. so <laughs> um we run out there i grab i grab the guy he grabs his equipment and we drag him back to where we just came from and then i think man i'm really stupid man because we, why didn't we drag him? why you just side? go the other way yeah why because <laughs> Because as we were running out there, um, somebody had fired a law rocket, and the law rocket goes right in front of us, and it's like moving in slow motion. You can just kind of watch it moving, flying right in front of us, and it's like slow motion. And it hits this gas truck, and it explodes, but the gas truck doesn't explode, um, which is not saying much for law rockets. But um, right, right. Uh, but. Yeah, I just kind of watching that thing fly right in front of me as I'm running out to get this guy. But like an idiot, we run back to where we just came from. And now we're sitting over there and the firefight's still going on. The medics start taking care of this guy. And um, so the lieutenant turns to me, goes, all right, we got to go to our assembly point. I'm like, oh, hell no, we're not going across that. <laughs> I just pulled on him what he pulled on me <laughs> right before that. I'm like, oh, hell no, we're not going. He goes, yes, we are. <laughs> he starts running. I'm like, crap, I hate that guy. So... <laughs> Run across all that then, mess again, yeah. right through that firefight again to get to our assembly point. But we made it there. There was a, you know, we were, we had a Bravo company took a lot of casualties uh, for, for that conflict. And um, we, we were pretty busy. You know, we had AC 130s, we had little birds, we had A7s back then. Uh, nice. But uh, we had, a you know, a fair amount of casualties. So we we're having to try and take care of them too. Yeah. We had one guy who had gotten shot and it was just a graze wound basically across his knee, but it opened his knee wide open, but it, oh. the, the flesh was, it wasn't bleeding, you know? So the medics were all tied up and I'm thinking, you know, back then they always made us carry uh, sewing kits and all that stuff. And our, you know, your standard rat, uh, ranger uh, packing, uh, yeah, yeah. I had a sewing kit in there. So thinking, all right, I got a sewing needle and a <laughs> thread. So basically sewed him up with that sewing kit. Oh my God. And he went on his way. I had a medic stop me a couple of days later. He goes, are you the one to use the sewing kit? I'm thinking, oh, he's going to yell at me. I'm like, I'm screwed. He goes, you did a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> but it was kind of funny, but uh, so it was pretty hectic that first night, uh, you know, cause you're trying to get, aircraft to come in we had an aircraft suck up some parachutes and uh you know because once we hit the ground then they started bringing aircraft in right uh, to land with equipment and stuff like that they had drum they have dropped some rsobs and stuff like that uh gun jeeps and they landed off the drop zone some of them landed in the woods some landed in the swamp um, they had rangers that had landed outside of the drop zone and had to fight their way into the drop zone to turn around, and be able to fight back out. Right. So it was just kind of crazy. Um, so there was people pretty much all over the place. So the first night was pretty hectic, but, um, they reached all their goals and they did it pretty quickly. Uh, um, the next morning was kind of a cleanup session, but I'll tell you the, the best feeling was because the first night we uh, we just kept on, you know, hearing about the casualties or the wounded or the the failures. You know, you don't hear about all the successes that are going on. You just you know, the failures are being reported to us. You know how it is in that little talk, you know, that yeah, little yeah. company level talk where it's, you know, you're the company commander and 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 his little staff. And you're one of those guys as the as the uh, ETAC e back then, but as the JTAC, right. you know, it's just that little circle. So you're getting all that bad news and you're just kind of getting there thinking, Oh crap, are we losing? You know what, you know, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. You know? So, and then uh, one of the guys that was uh, listening, uh, one of the psyops folks was listening to the local radio stations and they're putting out all this propaganda about how they were, you know, defeating us and all these other things. And yeah, yeah. which was, wasn't true, of course, but, sure. you know, but you're, you're hearing all that stuff, you know, and you're, 
fairly young guy, you start to believe it, but, right, right. but we were actually doing really well, but you know, you, you're just getting the bad stuff coming back to you. Sure. Um, so in the morning when it came, the sun came up, uh, it was really nice to see the American flag flying, you know, and, uh, and the flag. Uh, so that, that kind of reboosted you. Um, then that day we had, uh, we did have a friendly fire incident, uh, with a, with a little bird took out a squad and that was, um, not necessarily a good time or whatever, but, uh, it was an incident you know, we had to overcome it. Um, and then, uh, we started clearing this, uh, that uh, for lack of a better term, our company was clearing in our area was a, like a recreation area or something. I don't know. Um, we came across yeah. uh, a ranger who had burned in. He had obviously been shot um, while he was in the air or whatever and burned in and he had, he had mm-hmm. perished as well. Um, but I'm deliberately not mentioning any names cause you know, families, but for sure. Uh, for sure. Yeah. I, mean, I know it's been a long time, but still respect for them. Uh, but um, so, you know, that day two was kind of a little bit demoralizing in, in those aspects, but um yeah, like you seen everything in the light of the day. I'm sure. Yeah, it was. Still, still, still had a lot of successes, and and at that by that point, we already knew. You know, we were, um, we had achieved our mission goals, and we were successful. Uh, at the it, things started kind of calming down. We secured the area, secured the airfield, um, and for the rest of the war, uh, everything that we did, the seventh ID would follow behind us. Right. So we, yeah. would, we would take something down and then they would come in and secure it after we were done. And um, I just remember the first time the seventh ID guys come rolling in to take over things. Uh, we were transitioning out of perimeter security, pulling back in to go for our next mission. And they were uh, going in the foxholes. And, you know, there's um, back in those days, there was two things that, uh, if you wanted to make a ranger happy, dip and right. sunflower seeds. You, know, you always, <laughs> always tell us rangers are in town because there's sunflower seed uh, shells all over the place, you know. <laughs> so those two things, you know, those are like gold to rangers. Yeah, yeah. And um, I remember us, you know, we, we already pulled back in and um, – we heard an explosion. And we're like, well, what the hell was that? You know, cause we, we had gotten mortared. They had launched a few mortars on us that second day. They didn't really hit anything. Um, but you know, they, uh, ste- stepping back just a little bit, uh, one of the Rangers made fun of me because they <laughs> never saw me run so fast. We had, uh, that second day we were getting them mortared and, um, they started walking the mortars in towards where we were. And I'm thinking, who the hell, how are they watching us? Well, yeah. they're probably one of the biggest tree that was around there. They were probably just going for that big tree. <laughs> so we did and the company commander's like, okay, we got to relocate. So, I mean, like I beat every ranger, all my heavy equipment, I beat every <laughs> ranger to the relocation. <laughs> now get over there. Like we never saw you run so fast. <laughs> Well, you, know, you, you uh, never had a reason to before. Launch yeah. a few mortars at me. I'm going to run fast. If I'm going <laughs> yeah. fast, I'm going to run faster. <laughs> so, uh, just backing up a little bit on that. But, um, so, uh, we heard an explosion. Well, we hadn't heard any real explosions for a day, basically, essentially mm-hmm. a day, because we had secured everything at that point. Um, so, shortly after that, and then all of a sudden the perimeter just lights up and it's just, goes like a went around the clock it started at 12 o'clock and went all the way around and all of a sudden there's this big giant firefight going on all over the place well there was no enemy there there's just the soldiers you know guy next to him started firing so they all started firing oh my god and um, this is seventh id that was shooting. yeah so what had happened was some rangers traded hand grenades for dip from the seventh ID guys. Well, apparently they weren't allowed to have hand grenades. Well, they proved it within the first five minutes of having a hand grenade because the guy blew himself up and is. Oh no. And so I remember the company first sergeant coming out and he just lighting into everybody. If any of you sons of bitches give a a trade hand grenades for dip anymore, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have you. 
court martial, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. It was just all multiple. Do not trade your hand grenades. Do not give them any ammo, blah, 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 because it was just kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I think our that sounds next about right, though. Mission, but... Yeah. Our, our next mission was uh, we uh, did a prisoner, uh, took prisoners at uh, a place called Panoma Ney. Um, I just, it was very uncertain. The guy, the commander of that unit wanted to give up his unit, but we didn't really fully trust the guy. You know, I just remember yeah. um, he was with us and um, I just kind of remember, you know, uh, we're going to put that guy in front of us. He's going to be the first one off the helicopter. So if, <laughs> if this is an ambush, he's going to pay the price, he's right? First, yeah. yeah. He's going to be the first one to get it. So uh, it wasn't an ambush. Um, they did surrender to us, but the funny thing about that was um, they surrendered to us. So we we're kind of pulling security on them facing inward, you know, pulling security for them. I mean, on them as prisoners until the, they're repatriating them or whatever, you know, making them saying, okay, we're, we're on your side now, which yeah. kind of blew, blew me away. We're fighting them one minute and then next minute we're saying, okay, you're on our side. Um, mm -hmm. But the local villagers came out and they wanted us to turn them over to them so that they could kill them. So now so, we had to turn around and face out to protect the prisoners instead of guarding the prisoners because the local villagers wanted to kill them. <laughs> so, uh, and they were getting kind of rambunctious. And uh, so we were trying to think of ways to, because you didn't have non-lethal stuff back then, you know, there wasn't right. a lot of non-lethal stuff. So, um, and even if you did, I mean, you wouldn't jump at that stuff in, you would have your, your, you know, yeah. Your, so, yeah. yeah. So, um, we had an AC-130 overhead, and back then they had these spotlights on them um, where they could actually spotlight the ground, right? So yeah. uh, I thought, well, let me try that um, because they had – the Panamanians as a whole by then had built up a fear of AC-130s. <laughs> so um, I had the AC-130, and they didn't like doing that sort of thing because it you know give, gives them away. But sure. um, they knew it was civilians. And uh, my only other choice was maybe to put a few rounds down at a field, but – you know, I didn't, we didn't know if they, there were people in the field or not, you know, sure, right. the technology wasn't quite as good then as it is now. Right. Um, so I had them spotlight the crowd and that worked. I mean, it was like, he took a flashlight and on a bunch of bugs and they just scattered everywhere. <laughs> they just <laughs> took off. And that, that was the end of that. For nice. the of that. But, um, so that was, uh, you know, my, my, real big first mission was uh, <laughs> <laughs> like uh, literally. Yeah. We, <laughs> we went into garrison for a day or two. Then we, um, on Christmas day, we took down, they pronounced it the city of David, but we took down the city of David on Christmas day, right. which it's gotta be sacrilege. I think somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm going right. to have to explain that one. Um, <laughs> but it was a peaceful takedown. I, I, we, Got to the airport. That was fairly easy to, um, to take down. Uh, we had to go to the local um, barracks to again to repatriate the uh, Panamanian forces. Right, so we didn't have any yeah. real way to get there. So they loaded us up in those colorful Panamanian buses. Remember those buses? We're all and, oh yeah, yeah. And they put me and the fire support guys on the top so that we would we, we <laughs> control the aircraft overhead as on our convoy. So here comes the Rangers in those colorful buses down the road, you know, <laughs> <laughs> aircraft co providing cover over top of us, which is kind of, you know, hilarious. And I look at it these days, yeah. you would never do that today, but no, <laughs> it worked out there. We come pulling into town, but the town was very happy to see us. Um, it was another yeah. one of those situations where, you know, the locals basically thought, okay, this is our chance to take it out on the Panamanian forces that had been making us miserable for so long. And right. We ended up having to protect the Panamanians again. And um, we had a few other small missions, but you know, the, that had wound down pretty quick, but yeah. we, we, we lost a few guys while we were there, a few casualties. We had a pretty good wounded guys um during that um 
friendly fire incident. We had this one guy and again, I'm not mentioning any names, but he got shot on the buttocks. We, we didn't have body armor back then, but we had flak vests, right? But okay. the flak yeah. vests were better than a normal flak vest. So they okay. could stop around from a distance. Well, every round that hit him in his vest um, did not penetrate, but he had several rounds of his butt. You know, so <laughs> oh, he was mad because he's like, how am I supposed to go home and tell everybody I got shot in the ass? Yeah. <laughs> so he wasn't very happy about that but because of that because of him uh i kept my body armor on me all the time and it was hot yeah. and it was miserable oh yeah but i left it on and there was only a few of us that did most of the guys just dumped it right away because it was yeah. just hot and miserable but and when guys would ask me why haven't you dumped that yet and i might like, ask and i won't mention his name but ask him when you see him again and i'll uh, he'll tell you why i wore that yeah. Because he would have been probably killed had he not had his body armor on. Man. Because that stopped all those rounds. Yeah. That, you know, penetrated his torso. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm keeping that crap. <laughs> I mean, that's a good decision. I mean, you just never know. You know, it's like it's a trade off. Do you want to? I mean, you're miserable, but then if some clown, you know, takes a shot at you, you get a little more chance of surviving if you Look had it. How many you know, times so. our body armor saved lives in, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You, you ever see that video of that guy who got shot and hit him in the body armor? It knocks him down, but he gets right back up. I know. Like, who, the heck, who the heck just shot me? He's looking around like, who just shot me? You know, uh, it was his body armor that saved him. So, well, you know, Kevin Liberté was telling me a story about that guy uh, in Iraq that the dude had a grenade and the guy just jumped on him with his body armor and the grenade went off and the ranger lived, but the other guy of course died. And yeah. it's like, yeah, man, the body armor is for real. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I know it's, obviously it's better now, but you know, at all, anything at all is better than just getting shot right in the body, you know? Yep. <laughs> you know? Yep. So how long were you guys down there? Like what was your, what was the timeline? Uh, it was only a few weeks. So we jumped in on the 20th of December and we were out of there by mid January. Oh, okay. Well, it was really fast. Um, we were in and out of there pretty fast. Yeah. Um, were you guys, uh, did you go to Noriega's place at all? Or were you, was that? Not <laughs> well, you know, some of those other little things that we did, you know, I, I remember one place we rolled up on, um, we, um, a, it was a warehouse full of weapons. Um, we took a place like that. And then, um, I did go to his, so on Rio Hato, he had a house there. I went down there um, uh, to help with a uh, bomb damage assessment. They wanted to see how well the F-117s did. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So I went in there, and uh, I don't know if they still have it at the one, at the 17th, but I took some stuff out of his desk. It was a pen and some currency or something like that, a couple of other little yeah. things. And I then I donated it to the 17th when I left. If you remember that little heritage thing we had, Yep. I had a pile of stuff in there from Panama that I got out of one of Noriega's uh, places. Nice. Um, there was another place that we took down that we found. Uh, and this is exactly why that guy needed to be taken down. You know, we yeah. found um, some videotapes and so uh, we threw them in the thing and it was, it was Nor Noriega and his cronies they would have sex with these uh, young girls or these young guys and then kill them afterwards. And they, would, they videotaped it all. I mean, like, what kind of sick people do that sort of thing? But um, so, you know, stuff like that, that, you yeah. know, those things were in the, his little offices or whatever, his little places or his houses or whatever. So they get to do a little bit of that. Um, but it, so we had, a, it was, Short and sweet. Um, I hate that uh, we took any casualties. We had uh, some guys who gave that all, ultimate sacrifice. Uh, yeah. And those are the guys you never forget. You know, the funny right. thing is um, I can remember Panama like it was yesterday for the most part. Yeah. And, but then when I try to remember a lot of stuff that we did in Iraq and Afghanistan, I have a hard time remembering it because I just kind yeah. of, by that point, um, I guess it was just more of a, I didn't think about things like, 
I, you know, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, cause that, I, that was your, like your first exposure to that kind of thing. And I, yeah, and so you kind of remember that lot, more than all the others. For sure. Yeah. And like a lot of guys, and I tell a lot of guys this, I, I didn't get in that many scrapes in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we pretty much, we went in at night and we had, you know, superior firepower and whatever surprise. But um, some guys got into some scrapes, but I mean, that what you guys did, I mean, just getting, you know, there was um, tracer fire and you guys probably had some flack of some sort, some anti-aircraft, uh, you know, guns were going so off while you were coming in. Anti-aircraft guns. They had one that uh, uh, when I went to go down to do look at the craters, there was an anti-aircraft gun that uh, apparently an AC-130 had hit and there was a hand still on the trigger. <laughs> there was Jeez. no body. No body. All right, right. right. There was a hand on the trigger of the anti-aircraft gun that was still stuck oh. on that aircraft. Anti -aircraft. That was a nice shot. Yeah. <laughs> nice shot by the gun. He, just, he disappeared, essentially, I guess. <laughs> <clears throat> so there was anti-aircraft <clears throat> firing as well. I remember <clears throat> you may have probably run into him because he stayed at the Rangers forever. Um, I think he was a, a master sergeant by the time I left. A uh, guy that had the big giant scar across his whole head that a Panamanian had walked up on him and shh shot him i mean point blank with an ak and he lived <clears throat> what did you just like ride hit his helmet or something so, and i think it hit his skull and traveled around the outside oh my god yeah and he lived um i'm not yeah, it's dang. amazing yeah <laughs> god was watching out for you that day brother no doubt you know so but so you guys um, uh my only redeployed my only wound from panama okay. was I bumped my elbow on the runway when I landed and I got jungle rod in it. And so I still have a scar there. So oh, did, you? <laughs> <laughs> did you get a proper heart or anything for it? Or? Yeah, no, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I just had my little boo-boo that I still have on my elbow from when I hit the runway real hard. <laughs> no elbow Probably pads. I huh? didn't do a good PLF, which, you know, yeah, right. as you guys know, I didn't do good PLFs a lot. I don't think any of us did really, frankly, man. It was just kind of, you know, you just fall like a sack of crap and then, you know, try not to try to get best. up and get going. Yeah. I remember, Kenny likes to tell this story. Um, I was, we were, I think we were at, uh, what's the, uh, Valdosta, the Air Force base down there. Oh, Moody? We were, yeah, Moody. We were jumping in, um, jumping Halo and, uh, I, thought it was kenny that told, told the story he was coming i was coming down he goes, all right you want to see how it's done jazz is going to show you how it's done well i did a face face plant so hard that i had grass shoved all up in my mask i mean it was just like he's, he comes over he's like dude what the hell man you just bears the crap out of me <laughs> sorry man. you always used to say pi or die that was what they used to say right. all the time pi or, or die, or die. And uh, I see, I've seen a couple of those, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, maybe, maybe not downwind, but kind of close to downwind, I'm, you know. I'm I'm paying the price now for all those PI or die landings. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of that, that reminds me of uh, that jump fest we went on where uh, I don't remember who our fourth was, it was me, you, and Kenny, and I was jump master. And who's our fourth guy? Do you remember, you know, what I'm talking about where I put Kenny in the trees. Yeah, I don't remember. And he was on the front page of the Fayette, yep. Fayette yeah. Observer. Yeah, the ambulance over for him to stand <laughs> yeah. on top of to get out of his parachute. Yeah. yeah. Who was the fourth guy? I can't remember. I, it probably, it sucks. I, we should remember that. I just, it just escapes me right now. I don't know. Film fests were never good for me. I mean, yeah. I, one time at Shaw, I landed on the runway and there was an F-16 waiting to take off and all that stuff. <laughs> and you had to shut his engines down. And, <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, and one time I burned in when I was an airman, I burned in on a jump fest. Oh my God. Yeah. What, what do you mean? Like you just had like, well, a... you know, uh, you remember don't ever fly under anybody or fly over oh, anybody. Yeah. Or so everybody gets target fixated. So one of the other guys on my team flew under me, my parachute collapsed and I fell the rest of the way. Luckily I landed in the pea gravel, but, um, I, I messed up my back and my knees. Um, how high were you, do you think? Uh, it estimated about 90 feet. That was about 90 feet. And it had, you know, the parachute like it wasn't worse me, than that. Parachute slowed me down just enough that I didn't seriously injure myself. But Oh, reinflated uh, like a little bit? Well, maybe you got something, a little bit of lift. It didn't reinflate. You know, it just provides a little bit of drag, I guess. But I hit pretty hard. I mean, everybody said they felt me hit. 
And, you know, so they're standing outside the pea gravel pit. They said, we felt the ground when you hit and we all thought you were dead. Oh um, my God. But they loaded me up on a Huey helicopter as a medevac, which is probably worse than landing on the ground. You're it shaking. Like, I hope we make it. <laughs> You're already hurting real bad. But when they were loading me up, um, one of the guys, they, they're carrying me over in the stretcher, right? And one of the guys, his shorts falls down while they're carrying me. I guess his shorts were too baggy. So he lets go of the stretcher to pull his pants back up. And I fall off the stretcher on the ground again. And now they got to load me back on the stretcher again. Put me on a helicopter. I'm sure that didn't help your back at all. No. <laughs> But it's funny now, you know. But yeah, it's hilarious now. Oh, yeah, yeah. At the time probably not so much. At the time, I was like, "What the hell, man?" <laughs> <laughs> Things we do. So you got back from Panama. Um, how long? How much longer did you stay there until you went to the? Um, did got, you? Go, you said you went to Korea from there. In, I got assigned in Korea in uh, ninety two to ninety. Wait a minute, ninety three. I think it was 93 and 94. I left, came back out, went back to Bragg in 94, I think. That makes sense. Cause I went yeah. to jump master school in 94. So yes. Yeah, so and that's when I probably saw you. Yeah. That was 88 to 92. I was out bending the first time, I think. Okay. Yep. Um, and then, but the second time when you went to Bragg, that was the 22nd. Yeah. So um, I, I, actually had orders to the 22nd and then they, they, they the 22nd hadn't stood up yet. Okay. So they sent me over to uh, back over to the debt one until the 22nd stood up and then they moved me over to the 22nd. Okay. And so, and then, so we just kind of a group of us were the first ones for the 22nd. Now they, they already had some, um, and I think we were still ETAX then they already had some ETAX that had been assigned, but they, they operated out of uh, um, uh, out of SF command. Not um, they didn't weren't at the groups yet. Uh, okay. So, and the twenty second was the first time as we were transitioning the group. So I got assigned to the seventh group. Okay. Right. Were you guys was the twenty second only supporting third and seventh at the time, or did you guys do all, everybody fifth and first and tenth? So there was OLS that did the others. I think okay. I think they belonged to the 22nd. Uh, we had a senior master sergeant that ran our unit. So, you know, I think I'm pretty sure they were OLs out of okay. out of the 22nd, the other locations, the other groups. OK, we stayed real busy. I mean, we were just we constantly were going places and doing things. And it was another good place to be assigned because you got to be exposed yeah, yeah. to a lot of good stuff and. Um, I enjoyed that too. That, who all, uh, who all were you there with at the 22nd? Okay. Um, so at seventh with me, I think it was, um, Griffith. Sorry if you don't remember. I mean, I, yeah, I hate to put you on the spot. Yeah, no worries. I'll try. Um, it was Griffith with me and Tim Stamey and, um, uh, crap. I'm having a brain fart on some of them, but, and they'll probably want to punch me in the face because I forgot. But <laughs> I know I, I probably shouldn't have said anything. I'm like, <laughs> I have a hard, time, I have a really hard time remembering some stuff now. I just, when I'm I got like, it, I, I feel the same found, way. Yeah, it's, they found some lesions on my head and in my brain, and so I guess. Oh, really? I guess I must have banged my head one, one too many times, or had too many concussions. <laughs> I mean, too many, right. too many shock, untreated concussions. Shock probably, waves yeah. and uh, bombs going off or something. I don't know. <laughs> So what, yeah, what kind of stuff were you doing at the 22nd? What, uh, I, cause I, I, I knew you got that existed. Uh, I didn't know anything about it. And yeah. So and it, I mean, another was... thing that's cool is that, um, I've kind of talked to guys like Matt Schleich and, um, you know, Chaz Bocook and some other dudes that have yeah, like done as Rangers. Involved. Yeah. They were. So, yeah, yeah. They did Ranger mission and they did the saw the SF yeah. mission. Yeah. So were, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd love to hear your take on, you know, the differences and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, um, the one thing I liked about the Rangers was, you know, I was assigned to a company and I stayed with that company. Right. And so, yep. you know, that, and, and I got to know those guys and we, we developed relationships and stuff and, um, and you build it to trust and stuff like that. For so sure. 
22nd, you know, you got to do a lot of good stuff, but you were constantly tossed from ODA to ODA to ODA. You're not, you weren't assigned to a particular ODA, right? You weren't even assigned to a particular company. So mm-hmm. it was whatever company or whatever ODA was doing close air support. That's who you went with. So it was constantly new people all the time, which, you know, that became our life whenever, you know, when we got to Afghanistan and Iraq, right. You know, you were just right. constantly with new people all the time. So it wasn't new to me then, you know, <laughs> yeah. I got used to not having relationships with the people that I was in combat with, but, um, they, uh, so it was, it was very similar to what we did at the Rangers, but just not as intense. Okay. You know, I mean, the, uh, SF just kind of does things a little differently. Sure. And to me, ODAs, were there was a wide variety you had ones that acted like the rangers and then you had ones that were very laxed you know um and you know you can go into combat with them it was the same way you know if you go out go out on a mission with them you had ones that you know their team sergeant was an old ranger guy or something like that and they ran that team like the rangers and then you had other ones that were more laxed about things um uh, so it was just such a wide variety. So you, yeah. you just kind of had to f- work with whatever you had, you know, whatever team you were there, there with. Kind of had to figure out their dynamic and be like, okay, this is yeah. how I have to be with these dudes. Yeah. And and so during the um, OEF and OIF, I I got to go out with uh, 19th group, 20th group, 5th group, 3rd group. I, you know, I got to support all those groups, the teams. Nice. Um, I don't remember. I don't think I ever did seventh group or 10th group when I was at OEF or OIF, but, and then, you know, you get such a diversity you, working with the guard guys at 19th and 20th. It, it was so weird because, you know, like I remember one team I was on, like one of the guys was a ranger that I was in the Rangers with, but he had gotten out. Know. He was an attorney. He was like a high paid attorney or whatever. And here he is, a <laughs> E6, you know, uh, like a 18 Bravo or something like that. I'm like, dude, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> You're probably losing money every day. You're here. He's like, yeah, right. but I can't give it up. You know, and our, and our, um, our medic on that team, he was a doctor and a dentist and he was the enlisted medic. I'm like, how does that happen? How does that work? But uh, they you know, ma- amazing people that are willing to drop everything and go fight a war, you know, for sure. And, and earn very little to do it. So, <laughs> right. But, yeah. Know, taking major pay cuts to do so. Yeah. yeah. And at the time I'm thinking, man, you're dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they're great guys to go, <laughs> to go out on missions with <laughs> I, that same team. I remember one time, uh, we had gotten Intel, um, uh, about a camp that was right over the Iranian border, right? And so that's one that we had been chasing a long time. These guys are going in and out of. And so I got the bright idea. Let's let's request a Moab, you know? <laughs> and see, you know, but it was denied, of course, because I wasn't allowed to drop in Iran. You know, sure, for sure. some reason, I wasn't allowed to drop across the border. Um, and, I, you know, the only thing in my mind was I want to be the first JTAC to drop a Moab. That'll be awesome. Yeah. But you okay. remember what happened a few years later? It ha- yeah. They did have a guy drop a Moab. I'm thinking, damn it, why couldn't that have been me? <laughs> Could have been you. <laughs> <laughs> I got denied just because it was in Iran. Big deal. <laughs> like if anybody deserves it, they do, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember talking to him back at the at headquarters at the Siege of Soda. And basically, I can just remember being on the phone with him saying, no one's going to know. It's going to make the camp disappear. They'll never know we dropped it. Yeah, who's going to tell? Who's going to say anything? <laughs> <Who's gonna know? laughs> no, but, you know, they had to play. They had to buy the rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that was a pretty good team to go. I, I When I um, met up with those guys, they were uh, aligned with a uh, Afghani unit. So I showed up and they were already embedded with them. And um, I got there at breakfast time. And so I they sit down and they're eating breakfast and they say, Hey, come sit down and eat breakfast with us. So I sit down and, and one of them says to me, um, don't 
eat the top or bottom piece of flatbread. I'm like, <laughs> why not? And they're like, trust us, just don't do it. And they're going, okay. And um, then shortly thereafter, here comes the cook, you know, in his man dress, his nasty, sweaty, gross looking man dress. And he's got the stack of bread up under his arm like this. And he's got a, he's <laughs> wearing a bread like that underneath his arm. <laughs> And, and I'm like, oh, I get it now. But then I turned to the same guy. I'm like, so how many times do you think that loaf has been shuffled? You know, and he's he's like, we know what we know. We see what that's we right, see. That's right. Don't that's read into it. Right. I don't want to know anything else. <laughs> we so. ran into a similar situation. The guy at Skin, uh, he couldn't reach. He couldn't see over the dash. So he put all the bread on the driver's seat and he'd sit on the bread while he was driving his truck into the camp. <laughs> like, don't eat the top piece. <laughs> yeah. The oh, stuff man. We, there's the stuff we see. So I kind of, I, I always have a tendency to remember the funny stuff, you know? Yeah, for sure. Because I, I just want to push out the bad stuff. <laughs> yeah, but, me too. So Iraq and Afghanistan, I, I have a tendency to more remember the, the funny things that happen. But um, another... Another time I was there, um, I was, that's the time that I went with um, RRD, um, mm -hmm. uh, team two with RRD for uh, oh, a little bit. And um, w they had to loan me to um, some uh, 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 OGA guys, if you will. And right. uh, so it was me, three OGA guys and a, a bunch of Afghanis. And um uh, that was my 40th birthday. And um, so the OGA guys knew it was my birthday. The commander that we had for the Afghanis uh, had gone to school in America. He spoke better English than I did. You know, he was <laughs> very fluent and smart guy. But, uh, we, you know, we ate like the Afghanis did, which you know, was a welcome change sometimes. Right. And But mm -hmm. then it gets old because it's the same thing every day. Uh, right. every meal, but it was a welcome change for a little while. But our meal that night was goat. And if you remember, um, you know, Afghanis would they would wrestle all the time. Afghani troops would wrestle with each other, and, yeah. and in that particular unit, they would wrestle each other for parts of pieces of food. Um, and the winner would get the choice pieces of food. Right. So that night we had goat, and because it was my 40th birthday. Um, they presented me with the goat penis because it brings <laughs> fertility. And, you know, the OGA guys are looking at me smirking and that <laughs> Afghani commanders looking at me smirking, you know, like, how's he going to get his ass out of this one? Right. <laughs> right. I'm, th I'm thinking I am not eating that thing. There ain't no way. I'm, <laughs> right, I'm right. also not going to create an international incident either. Exactly. So, I said, Oh, thank you very much. It is a great honor but I would like for your guys to wrestle for it. And I would like to give them the honor to, to have it. Nice. <laughs> and they Very all look nice. like, Oh, you jackass. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I wasn't going to do that thing. No. No. Cause there's sometimes, you know, you were, it, you know, it was that time of the year when you had, you could only eat it at nighttime. It was dark. So by the time, oh, we got yeah, food, yeah. by the time we got our food, it was dark or whatever. And I just remember a lot of times you get this bowl. It tasted really good, but, a lot of times it was like, snap, snap. You yeah, weren't like, quite sure what, what, what you're what, eating. What part of the goat is this? Yeah, yeah. What part is this that's so <laughs> chewy and acting very rubbery, but um, it tasted good, you know? But yeah, just I was thinking, uh, there is no way I'm eating that thing. But um, you know, <laughs> no way. Yeah, that was my 40th birthday, which is kind of funny. That's a memorable uh, birthday. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that same mission. Um, so, we kind of had a deal was, you know, I, one of us, one of the four of us was always going to be awake, mm -hmm. you know, so kind of pulling security, pulling security on ourselves, you know, because sure. they're already having where Afghani troops were killing American soldiers and things like that. That was already happening. You know, we already knew that. So, right. Um, it was, it was my turn to sleep. I was sleeping and I get woken up by an Afghani and I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And they're like, we're being attacked. We're being attacked. And I'm like, I don't hear any gunfire. They're like, they're probing us. They're probing us. And I'm looking around for these OGA guys. I'm like, where the hell are they? Um, I don't know where they're at. 
So I'm thinking, well, did they go out on the perimeter with these guys? They're not answering the radio. I don't know where they, these guys are. Did Afghanis already kill them? Do I need to start whacking people? You know, I don't know. Man. I was kind of nervous about it. So <clears throat> I get on uh, radio and there happened to have been a couple Cobras that were flying through the area, uh, Marine Cobras. I got them overhead and I'm like, okay, uh, I need you to look outside our perimeter. I had uh, the Afghanis mark the perimeter and um, I said, I need you to look out. And they go, well, I've got some movement coming up a ditch line towards you guys right now. I'm like, he goes, you know, like, do you want me to hit them? I'm like, hold on a second. I'm missing my, yeah. I'm missing the rest of my team here. Um, so I'm like, how many is it? You know? And they're like, he's like three. I'm like, okay, just stand by. I said, do they have friendly markings? Nope. They don't have friendly markings. I'm like, well, I still don't want you to engage them. Right? Yeah, because those guys always weren't dressed uh, the way they were supposed to anyway. No, and they weren't guys, always so. doing things they were supposed to either. All right, right. So, um, sure enough, uh, I, you know, Afghanis, they came back in. One of them had to take a dump and had the other two guys go with them to pull security <laughs> and didn't have their friendly markings on them or anything like that and didn't bring their radios with them. And I was so mad at them, I said, I should have killed you guys. <laughs> was, you know how close you came. Uh, yeah, I'm just like, you have no idea how close – if I, if I didn't have the experiences I had had in the past or whatever, and I was a you know, guy that didn't try to think about what am I really hitting before I hit it, yeah. uh, you know. You yeah, got a more inexperienced guy or a younger dude who, you know, was maybe got a little or, skittish or, or. Yeah, or a little skittish or just, you know, didn't want to take the second to hesitate to make sure that you're going to hit what – really needed to be hit, you know? Right. Right. Um, Cause you know, I'm going back to Panama, you know, friendly fire incident with little birds, you know, so that's a lesson learned, you know, make sure you sure make sure you know what you're about to have an aircraft hit because there's no yeah, exactly. calling that back. Right. right. Once it leaves the yeah. aircraft, it's gone. Yeah. So that was a lesson learned for me. So I always applied that for the rest of my career was, you know, Hey, make absolutely sure what is about to get engaged. Exactly. Uh, you can't call it back. And uh, so that was a lesson learned before, but uh, the, you know, it's kind of a funny story now, but then I was, I was furious with them. They had, first, no, they had no idea how close they came to getting yeah, there. First because they left me by myself in there. Yeah. And I was asleep. They should have just woke me up at least or something. Like, like, yeah, just everybody go. Let's all four go. <laughs> Don't leave me here by myself. <laughs> Let's all wander out there without any markings and have a helicopter. <laughs> or have the well, so they, that's that's another thing. If they had got you up, you'd have been like, all right, get your markers on. Let's do, yeah. let's do it the right exactly. way. And I'll take a radio yeah. with you. <laughs> exactly. I don't you know. Yeah. <laughs> Hindsight's 2020, 20, I guess. Right. Sure. But, Maybe you really had to go. Who knows? He couldn't wait. <laughs> well, why didn't he just go into perimeter like everybody else? You know. Yeah, well, well, I mean, kind of what you said earlier about how they're not always doing the right thing. Who knows yeah. what they were really doing? You know. Yeah. I remember uh, one time. You know, I was with another ODA, uh, um, and we were um, at a fob with the Afghanis again. But um, I remember I was on this on a on the. Um, sat phone i was talking to my wife i had uh wendy on the phone and i'm talking to her and um i'm walking around the back side of the building just, just kind of wandering around trying to get that best signal or whatever sure and we had built you know um because afghanis you know had to follow the quran they you know had to go to the bathroom in a certain manner and all that stuff as you remember we had yeah. built facilities for them to be able to do that but they still wouldn't use them um so they just go behind the buildings and all that stuff well it was it was winter time so it was really cold and uh, I remember walking around there's a pile of poo with a wooden popsicle stick sticking out of it. I guess he must have used it to scrape the poo off his bottle. And I'm like, ah, and when he's like, what's wrong? I said, Haji poo on a stick. <laughs> so I had to, of course, pick it up and take a picture of it to bring it back home to show her what I was. Oh, my God. <laughs> Haji poo on a stick. <laughs> That's, I mean, but that illustrates, you never know what you're going to see. I mean, that yeah. it was like a different culture, a hundred percent different yeah. culture than we were used to. And, you know, you just take things for granted. And I mean, yeah, they were <laughs> different yeah. people. Yeah, it was <laughs> very, very different. Sometimes, you know, different in a good way and sometimes different in a way that, you know, wow, 
How can you? Yeah. I, that is always the thing that's gotten me these days. And it doesn't help with the job I have now. Um, but the terrible things that people can do to people, you oh, know, yeah. that's, it's always, and over there was just, I mean, I can't imagine even being that twisted to want to do that to somebody, you know, yeah, um, doing it to somebody. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering if like, it has something a lot to do with their disregard for, or their, they don't, like the sanctity of life, you know, we always talk about they that. Cher- they don't cherish life like we do. For sure. It just seemed like it's like, I, man, think, yeah. I think there was people who did, but then there's yeah. just people who don't. And, and that's true in any culture. I mean, I see for that. sure. Yeah. I, of course I don't want to broad brush the whole, every, yeah, the whole but, people. I mean, but, uh, some um, are better than yeah, I see it here with my current job too. Just people that just don't cherish life like they should. Uh, but then, you know, when, you have jobs like us and you see so much lot life lost and stuff like that. And you learn to cherish it real quick. For sure. Uh, and I, I hope that all my peers as they've grown older and stuff like that, have learned to cherish their own lives as well. And as you know, yeah. we, have, we have some buddies who struggle with that mm-hmm. um, uh, very much so. And um, I, I always, I always hope that they can get past that point and start cherishing life that they have for sure and not, and not waste, waste it. Cause you know, we got to live for those guys that didn't make it. Right. That's right. And I remember them and live for those guys that didn't make it through. But, um, so yeah, I just, I always try and remember the funny things. So I always tell the funny stories over and over again, not the, not the bad ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, I like those anyway. <laughs> yeah. Like those better. Um, uh, you remember when, uh, we were uh, about to go into Iraq when we were in Saudi Arabia, still at the, at the place where we were in Saudi Arabia and getting ready to jump in. Um, and, um, one of our teammates was getting ready to jump in and he asked me to, to give him a JMPI and, um, uh, cause he felt a little bit more comfortable with that. And yeah. so, you know, everything was, uh, everything you, the guys who were wearing was all heavy again, of course, you know, it was mm-hmm. loading them up as much as possible. The radios are smaller, but we'll fill you up with ammo, you know, <laughs> we'll exactly right. mortar, mortar shells. You got room in that yep. rock now, buddy. You're going to still jump. <laughs> you got plenty of room now for this stuff. Yeah. You're still jumping in a couple hundred pounds, buddy. You know, whether you <laughs> like it or not. So um, I was checking his rucksack and I had him sitting on his back. And um, so I lifted the rucksack up. You know how you did that when they're on their yeah, back? Yeah. The rucksack up on. And I got my knee on the ground and I'm looking at him and he's kind of welling up a little bit. I'm like, are you crying? You're not crying, are you? He goes, um, your knee is on my nuts, Sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, why didn't you tell me, man? Why didn't you? He goes, I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> I had my <laughs> knee right on his nuts. Apparently, you know, I, it was in the rocks. You I, thought he was like scared to go to combat. He's like, no, no, <laughs> I have an injury already. Before I even went, <laughs> you, you, you crushed my left nut, right? And I'm already purple heart guy. Already. <laughs> but as you know, that, that same guy also kept his company alive for a long time on the Hadith yeah. and did oh, amazing yeah. things. And I think me crushing his nut that night was the least of his worries over the next few days <laughs> uh, i had not heard that story i, I had not heard that you, one you didn't, you didn't know that one yeah that's pretty uh-uh. funny i missed that yeah. one because you know that guy you he, i don't think you know he's tough as nails you know he wouldn't have i would have never imagined you know that he would have been nervous about doing stuff like that or whatever you know we've already been yeah, yeah. i've already been in afghanistan done great things and everything you know and uh, and, and obviously, you know, he did really great things the next few days with his company. Yeah. But so it just, I'm like, dude, you got, you're like tearing up. What the hell's the problem? That doesn't make sense. What's your yeah. problem, man? Are you okay? Are you going to make it? You know? <laughs> yeah, Sergeant, your your knee is on my nuts. <laughs> this is so wrong. <laughs> I think I lost you again, JD. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I like I like to remember the funny oh, things. Man. I like to remember for the, sure, for sure. 
the remember the Porta John issues we had there at that camp. They just kept piling deeper and deeper and deeper. And I never saw them. You talking about the one uh, during OIF? Yes. Before we went in, uh, and the, the Porta Johns were all backed up and everything. Um, guys are just, they weren't cleaning them out. So they you'd walk into a Porta John, it'd be like a pile of poo over the t- toilet seat. And you'd see where somebody would like spray it all over the back wall and stuff. You're like, what? What is wrong with people? <laughs> you know, you couldn't under, you know. I remember I saw a sign in the shower in Afghanistan you know, they want once. Light it had a guy. You're like, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. You know, they want light discipline, but you're like, I'm no, not no, going no, to I... down without a flashlight. And I'm not, and it's not going to be a red or blue or green. Oh, yeah, exactly. It's going to be a white light so I can see every last clue <laughs> that's in there. <laughs> yeah, the last thing you want to do is sit down to somebody else's mess. Yes, exactly. <laughs> But, all right, go ahead. I'm sorry what you're saying. No, no, I, I just remember the sign in Afghanistan. It was in the showers, and you talk about people that do, you know, nasty things in the latrines. And there's a sign. It had a guy that was squatted down. It was in the shower, and it had like it was like a stick figure, and it had poop coming out, and it had a, a circle with a line through it, like "Don't poop in the shower." <laughs> like, like who's doing that? You know, they had to put a sign up to stop people from pooping in the shower. <laughs> like, come on, man. I don't even know how they could do it. It wasn't the drains were like, you know, I don't know. Oh, I guess it was an emergency. I don't know. Yeah. You know, who, who knows? I don't yeah. doubt. Well, so here's another funny one for you. <clears throat> the first time I went to Afghanistan, you know, it was still early enough that they didn't have the roads paved. They didn't have the camps paved. You know, everything was, it was like that powdery dirt, you know, everywhere you yeah. walked, it was like walking on the moon. It was kicking up the dirt and everything. Um, and we were living in the tents and we had yeah. mice running over you and everything. They were so brazen that you would open a bottle of water and put peanut butter in it and they would run in it and then you close it up on them, you know, because the mice would crawl all over you and everything. But um, I had gotten uh, oh. sick really bad. And the Porta Johns were on one side of the camp. My tent that I was staying in was like in the center and then the showers were on the opposite side. Um, and so I would be in my tent. I'd have to crap. I would never make it all the way to the um, Porta John's. I'd be on my hands and knees in that powdery dust, puking out one side, crapping my pants on the other side, oh. and then <laughs> turn around, <clears throat> get new fresh stuff, go all the way to the showers on the other end of camp, get a shower, get all cleaned up, get back to my stuff, and it would start all over again. Oh. I would never make it to the Porta John. <laughs> I I probably crapped myself like four times that night and puked all in. That. A lot of people did, man. A lot of people used to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, for those for those who best. don't know, that's not a it's a it's a pretty common thing. Just uh, yeah. just from being filthy or you know whatever. But yeah, uh, I I had gotten I had developed an allergy to malaria medicine, oh. so I couldn't take malaria medicine anymore after that. So all those other deployments that we went on, I I wasn't allowed to take the malaria medicine. I was just taking my chances. Oh my god, you didn't take like um. Was it? It wasn't uh, primaquin or mefloquin. Yeah, it was so the, they're uh, they're tetracyclines. So I had developed a allergic. Yeah, yeah that's right. I, yeah, yeah and I, I think it used or... to. Kind of, it built up to an allergic reaction. It wasn't always. I didn't. It wasn't always that way because early in early days we used to get gamma globin shots where they put this shot of like toothpaste in your butt right before they put you on an airplane and have you sit for eight hours on your way to Panama, right? Um, on that shot of yeah. toothpaste, but but. You know, I never had issues then, but I developed it um, when I was in Afghanistan, the allergy to tetracyclines. And that's what it was. It turned out to be that I was oh, allergic man. to the malaria medicine. Oh, that's why that was happening? Yeah, but you want to talk oh, about geez. a miserable night, man. <laughs> it was a miserable night. It was And, and then, you know, they didn't have laundry <laughs> facilities and stuff then, so we were still washing our stuff in buckets. So I don't think I ever got that crap smell oh. out of them close for the rest oh, of the man. trip. Jeez. Do you remember you remember the time I crapped myself on a halo jump at Benning? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was I was the jump master. I had to go really, really, really bad. And I thought, well, as soon as I get on that drop zone, as soon as I get on that drop zone, I'm going to run into the woods and I'm going to go to the bathroom. Well, <laughs> We were a halo jumping. And as soon as my parachute opened, that you know that opening shock? Oh, yeah. It made it shoot right out of my butt. Right <laughs> <into> my <stomach>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I didn't say anything to anybody. I left my 
jumpsuit on. I think it was summertime and everybody's like, why are you leaving your stuff on, man? I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm all right. I'm good. <laughs> it's fine, on, yeah. on the bus to ride back from Friar DZ and everybody keeps thinking, who keeps crapping their pants? And it was me that crapped my oh. pants. They literally crapped my pants on a halo <laughs> jump. <laughs> There's really no holding it in. If it's right, if it's yeah, on the cusp yeah. of coming out, yeah. yeah. Once you hit the opening yeah. shock, you're it's that opening shots. It's going to come out. Yep, and it did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh man! Um, I'll I'll tell you another funny story. At the risk of these guys will hunt me down and kill me now that if I tell this story, and I'm not All even right. going to mention any names, but they're going to know it because of what happened, and then they're going to hunt me down and kill me. So we can't tell anybody where I live. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, it was a training exercise. Remember when we used to go down to uh, Vegas Island all the time off of Puerto Rico and do yeah, yeah. I never made it down there myself, but yeah, I remember guys going. Yeah, down we used there. to go it was pretty regularly. The Rangers used to yeah. go down there, and it was really the whole island's covered by these thorny bushes. I mean, the thorns are like four inches long. It's just nasty. The whole island. When you yeah. jumped in, you never wanted to land off the runway. You wanted to land on the runway because you would get in those bushes. It was terrible. So there was no going into the woods there or anything like that. And yeah. we were we had some time off and we went to this little alcove. Um, there was nothing on this alcove. There was two picnic tables, the little beach area, and that's it. You know, so um, that that's back when I used to still drink and um, we were getting pretty drunk and. Uh, I was I had to go to the bathroom about it. I'm like, I'm not even going in those woods. So I'm going to swim out into the ocean. I'm going to go to the bathroom and then, you know, hopefully it'll just sink to the bottom and I just swim away from it. Well, oh. it, it, it didn't. <laughs> it bubbled right up to the top and it made the big poo slick, right? And the current was going in. I thought you mean you had to go pee. <laughs> the, tide was, the tide was going in and not out. So now there's this giant poop slick going in towards all the other guys that are swimming. I'm swimming away from the <laughs> tide. <laughs> and so they had gotten the two picnic tables. They had them in the water. They were using them as boats, and they were fighting with each other. You know, rangers do what rangers do, right? Sure, sure. Here comes my poop slick slowly <laughs> working its way towards them. Oh, and I'm swimming farther and I can't even away. think about it. I can't. And one of them goes, somebody crapped in the water. I, you know, they used a different word, of course. And, uh -huh. um, and somebody crapped in the water. And and I'm, so I'm thinking, okay, they're all going to get away from it and swim. No, one of them grabs a pile of it and throws it at the other group. Oh, and, come you know, on. You made me gag. <laughs> now they're having a... <laughs> they're having, fighting each other with my poop. Oh, come on. But after... After a little while of that, then they realized what they are doing. And Did they not know it was – they didn't they know, it was, know it was me. They never knew it was me. But after they realized what they were doing, they realized, oh, crap, now we got somebody's crap all over us. And then they wanted to know who crap so that they could smear it all over that person. I didn't say uh -huh. a word. I'm just – No way. Uh -uh. Wham away, wandered off. You know, <laughs> I'm like, nope, not ever going to say a word. They, I, those rangers <laughs> have no idea to this day, and now they probably do. Who was the mad <laughs> that crapped yeah, in the water no, find it. <laughs> and they smeared it all over each other? Oh, my God. Yep. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I oh. learned my lesson early on when I was the, there the first time. Well, we used to go to Panama all the time to train, and it would rain yeah. really bad. And it was, it was all muddy at the range. And so they all started mud wrestling each other and everything. And pretty much the entire company is covered completely in mud. And there's me sitting off to the side, watching all this go on. Right. Uh -huh. And then they all turn to me and they say, Oh, look, it's the air force guy. He's all nice and clean. Let's yeah. remedy that. So I felt like I was at a rock concert. They literally lifted me up and passed me across their heads over their heads like that, you know, and then threw me in the mud <laughs> puddle and about 50 Rangers jumped on top of me. So, <laughs> I, yeah, you at least have to pretend you're <laughs> involved. That way, you're, so you're, yeah. Yeah. that way you wouldn't get uh, uh, <laughs> you know, sm smashed in the mud by fifty rangers. And <laughs> Isn't that weird? Uh, so when you're talking about going to Panama, was that before or after the invasion? So it was before and after. That's what I'm saying. Isn't that weird that we yeah. used to like people used to go down there? Like we had we had guys down like Keith Ingram and Eric Harris and. You know, uh, Steve they Cox, all those guys there. were stationed down there. Yeah, like during that invasion. And they so stationed crazy. after the invasion, too. 
It, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing, you know. And uh, yeah, I know it's crazy. And we, yeah, we went before and after the war, um, and that was a regular rotation for us to go down there and train. It was good training. Oh, great training for yeah. sure. Um, That's but, what you're talking about. Those spikes in Puerto Rico reminded me of Black Palm. Uh, yeah, the palm trees down there that had that big like spikes on it. You know, they would yeah. go right through your boot if you didn't have the steel plates in the bottom of your jungle boot. Yeah. Uh, did you go with us when we went into Puerto Rico that time and we trained and, um, no, I didn't get, I never went to Puerto Rico, but I, yeah, I'm talking we, about in Panama we, where they had that. Yeah. We went to Puerto palm. Rico a couple of times too. And, um, that black palm is nasty stuff, man. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of guys who had it just right through their hands and, yep. and, and it's it, easy it, too. Cause you'll just, you'll, you'll yeah, stumble just, and you'll reach out and try to stop yourself and yeah, it was right, right through. through. It. Yeah. 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 I remember, um, we, we're road marching back. The only people that had rucksacks, everybody jumped in. The only people that had rucksacks was the radio, the guys who carried radios. Right. Yeah. And, um, I was at school or something. So I missed, and we loaded up all the bags and shipped the bags or whatever. So I had to pack everything in my rucksack for that mission to oh. jump in. And that was, I had to have everything in my rucksack for the rest of the duration. Cause oh my so God. I had a really heavy pack. So we're going back in after the exercise and those 11 bang bangs, they're just moving out, you know, and, right. and we're all they're fast anyway with a ruck, let alone without we're all dragging. Just... But well, um, the first sergeant we had at the time, he was coming up to the guys with the radios and basically kind of saying, Hey, you know, you guys are dragging, butt. you can load your radios on the, on the trucks um, that would pick up the guys who fell out or whatever. Yeah. And, and so guys were slowly doing that. And myself and the fire support NCO, you know, kind of had a little competition going on. We're not, I'm not giving up my ruck until you give up your ruck. And, right. and so we're both dragging butt really, really bad. And all of a sudden he just no, he just passed out and did a nosedive right into the road. Just wham. Oh my God. And, um, and so the first sergeant comes up to me after that. He's like, are you ready to give up your ruck? I'm like, here you go. <laughs> So <laughs> all you, you can have it. I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll proudly give up. That's, that's how but, it was, though. I mean, it, yeah. you know, they had that was the mentality. You know, yeah. I'm gonna go until I drop that's flat right. on my face. You know, yep, that's right. But yeah, I felt those, like a new man after I got rid of that ruck. I was like, you right, you Bravos, we're walking kind of slow. Let's go. It <laughs> <laughs> was a sucky night too. Oh. Yeah, those are hard missions. That yeah, it was, yeah. Our objective was on top of a shale mountain. You'd crawl up ten feet, slide back fifteen. You know, it was, oh, just, it was just one of those nights. Yes. And then come back down the other side. We had so many guys that were hitting black palm that they finally stopped us and said, "All right, we're going to sit here and wait until the sun comes up because we're getting too many injuries with black palm yeah. as we're falling into it. They're grabbing it and." Um, cause everybody was exhausted by then. Yeah. Well, that was one thing about the Rangers and Panama. Like I was, I went down there before I went to the Rangers and we used to go to those classes and we, all those jungle ex experts would teach us all these things. And they're like, never sleep on the ground. Always cover yourself. Don't walk at night, you know, all these things. And then I went back down there with the Rangers and it was like, we did all that stuff, you know, walking <laughs> yeah, at yeah. night and, and, and I was like, uh, there, we were just, I remember we were on this patrol and we, we just stopped and like, okay, go to sleep. You know, everybody just sleep where you are. And I'm like, wait, shouldn't we get mosquito nets or something or something to cover our bodies or something? They're like, what nope. for? Don't worry about it. And the next morning, the first sergeant woke up and he was bloody from here to here because a vampire bat had come up and like, you know, nicked him oh, and just drank blood all night. Yeah. yeah. I was like, that's why, right? That's why, you don't, that's why you don't do that. Oh, man. I remember those green, solid green uh, uniforms that we used to wear, the jungles. They called them jungles. I guess they were jungles. Uh, like I don't know if I ever had those. I think I, I just well, had the BDUs. So the first I was the first time I was the Rangers. That's what we wore, and yeah, um, we did exactly that. We stopped one night, and apparently, I my leg was. Remember the leaf cutter ants? Oh yeah. Apparently, my leg was sitting in their trail. So when I woke up in the Jeez. morning, they had cut a hole, a slot <laughs> right through my back of my leg of my pants, and the rest oh, of the time, my pants are hanging down off me. You know, <laughs> wanting to fall off me the whole time because they cut a trail out of my pants because <sighs> they was in their way or something. <laughs> My wife gives me crap because I talk about Panama all the time, but man, that was some of the toughest uh, terrain I've ever experienced. Just the wildlife yeah, it's, and the it's not huge the jungle and yeah, just going through it though. It's oh it's, yeah, it was, it was good <laughs> brutal. Terrain. 
Yeah. For I sure. still have, I still have, uh, so the last time we went to Panama, um, we spent a, uh, remember that's, you know, we were doing a lot of, uh, those fire support guys and ourselves. We go off on our own with a couple of yep. problems and to do our stuff. And, um, uh, we would, uh, we spent a, a couple of days in the swamp and to this day, I still have this funk on my feet that it has never gone away. Ever since. <laughs> it's always been there. It, yeah. It Who knows up. what that is? Yeah. 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 I caught it there in the swamps of that. I mean, Panama. It's, yeah. That's a dangerous place, man. That's a yeah. danger. It's a brutal place. <laughs> it is, but, you know, got a lot of good fun stories about that place. Oh too. yeah. Like you, like you were saying it before, I mean, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I mean, what a, yeah. the experiences down there were just amazing. Yeah, they are. Yep. And get, like I said, you get really good training out of it. Oh yeah. Uh, that's one good thing. Okay. Is I've always been fortunate enough to have a lot of good training. Yeah. Uh, and it paid off. Well, that's what I, I mean. When we talk about, you know, you and we, we say like you, you've had such a unique career as because like you were with the Rangers, then you went SF, then you went back to the Rangers and you went to all these different locations. And back, back in the day when you guys stood the 22nd, even before that, like the old Ranger guys, uh, it was a different kind of time. I mean, you were doing so many kind of unique missions, you know, like, like ours are, ours kind of got really standardized and really, you know, run of the mill. I say run of the mill, but run of the mill for us, you know, like, yeah, yeah. You guys are still, doing a, a, it's still very different than the rest of the career field was doing though. For sure. Even, for sure. And, and that was, we were very unique from the rest of the career field when I was there the first time. Yeah. And it was just very, very different. You know, it was just, we were doing things that no one else was doing. Right. Yeah. You know? And we yeah, had, amazing. we had mission sets that no one else had, you know? Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, do you think it was because maybe it was a little newer then, like, um, uh, and it was, you're just kind of figuring it out. So everything was on the table at that point. Well, you know, almost. Yeah. Well, I mean, we had ETAX at, 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 you know, Rangers for long before I ever got there the first time. I mean, the yeah. really old guys like J Mac and all those old guys that were there, you know, for many years. Oh yeah. Like, like Grenada. They, they, they guys before, can... Yeah. They, you know, Grenada even before Grenada and all that stuff. Yeah. But um, there's still that, that group of people is very small, you know, if you look back at all of our peers, that group of people is still very small. Yeah. Um, many, even the guys that are there now, um, it, it may seem, you know, run of the mill and stuff like that, but that group of folks that will, will have ever done those positions is still very small. Yeah. And that's probably why we were, we'll stay friends for the rest of our lives and not talk to each other for years and then just pick up right where we left off because yep. it's a, such a small group of folks. And we went through some pretty rough things together and you just, you know, we'll always be yeah. there for you. You share those same experiences that are extraordinary and yep. just like and kind of solidifies that, that friendship. Yeah. 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 So, and you know, you and I went through some fun stuff together too. <laughs> yeah. You know? Like running over yeah. my back on a, on a leadership reaction course, and both my arms are dislocated. <laughs> and we we're still yelling at you to get up. Let's go because we were winning. I think we were ahead. So we I'm were like, winning. Come on, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yep. man, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, those are the stories. I remember I was talking to somebody the other day, and uh, now anytime anybody goes TDY they fly everywhere and they had to, I remember we put in so many miles in that squadron van driving yeah. down to Florida, driving to, you know, tenant or Kentucky or yeah. driving to brag. I mean, we drove for hours and hours in that thing. Just like, you know, we just fill it up and nobody could sleep because you'd get messed with if you ever fell asleep. And yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's for sure. Yep. Oh, man. Yeah. We did do a lot of driving just to go, just to go train. Yeah. There'd be like a cast range somewhere. I remember we went to Dare County and Fort Pickett and you know, just all over the place. I mean, Places I never that, even think about that. Your average Tac P or JTAC, they didn't do that. Right. You know, they, they waited until it came to their fort. You know, they didn't, yeah. they didn't chase air around like we did. They didn't have that um, experience that we had, which really paid yeah. off when the time came. Oh, for all sure. That, all that experience and, and you were, you know, I mean, 
I look back at what you all did um, and it was just, it's amazing. I mean, it's amazing what the 17th has done yeah. and continues to do. I mean, it's just, it blows me away every day. And I'm been very honored just to be a part of that group. Um, Same. And, Same uh, and then to be able to be a leader in a group like that too, is just amazing to me because it was easy when you have guys like you, it's easy to lead <laughs> um, hard to manage because everybody's a type of personality, but very, very easy to lead because you all were go-getters and doers and, and awesome at what you did. Well, I know that um, we all talk about you as, a, as far as like being there, being a good mentor for us. And like, I, we wouldn't have been, we wouldn't have been anywhere if it hadn't been for you mentoring us through that, all that stuff, especially in the beginning there. Well, I mean, you know, was- no, you guys would have still done amazing things. Um, you guys would have still done what you did. Um, I had no doubt in my mind because of who you all are and who you are. Um, but for me though, at that point, cause I was a little bit older than, than all y'all, um, you mm-hmm. know, cause like I said, I was you know, 40 when I was in the Rangers, you know? <laughs> so, um, uh, and I had seen, I've had that experience, you know, at, to that point, I, there was very few of us that had been to combat. Um, right. And, uh, I just wanted to make sure you all, cause you're my friends. I wanted to make sure you all came home alive, you know? that i i do remember you stressing that it wasn't so much as like okay this is how we're going to train because this is what you do it was you always put that that extra little bit on like look i've seen people die from not doing it the way the right way so Even in training i mean think of how many guys died in training yeah i mean, I mean soldiers died in training all the time yeah uh, and so it's just i just wanted to make sure y'all lived and survived <laughs> you know <laughs> We appreciate and, it. <laughs> and towards the end, I wanted to make sure you weren't as broken as me, you know? Yeah. I look back at it now and I probably, because everybody always remembers the time when they got chewed out by me, right? They don't ever remember anything else. They remember <laughs> yeah. when Jazz chewed, my, chewed me out, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I could have probably done it a little bit differently than I did, but um, I, I always felt really strong when it came to safety stuff. I was very, um, if you remember one time we were on a jump and one of our guys hooked up backwards and um, he was just fooling around the whole time. And he hooked up backwards and I punched oh, him. Oh, like on the, on the static line so, or on the, on the anchor line cable, yeah. you mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah he was backwards. I hit uh-huh. him in the back of his helmet. So hard. he turned around and he was ready to fight, you know, and, <laughs> and I pointed out of his static line. I said, right there. Um, Cause I really wanted to get his attention. Cause sure. he died. if he would have jumped yeah. out, he would have died. You know, I want to make sure that he, he remembered that for the rest of his life was the time he got punched in the back of his head <laughs> by the jump master because <laughs> the jump master wanted to make sure he didn't ever do that again yeah because he was yeah, there's like a time stuff. and a place for all that for, for goofing around and yeah you know there's certain things you yeah yeah but I'm that's sure he never forgot it no it was but the I, meat was it? no 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 it, <laughs> um he he got out I don't think he retired. He didn't retire. He got out a few years after that and he had a pretty successful career. Oh, he did. Yeah. But, uh, he, uh, I, hopefully he didn't ever forget that, uh, when that happened. But, yeah. Um, so yeah, I wasn't, I didn't always handle the things the best way back then, but now, you know, the funny thing is my boss these days, he's always telling me, you can't talk to people like that. <laughs> they are not in the military you cannot talk i'm like that's the only way i know how to talk to people yeah i know it's like i, I that's I, I can and i will I, it's so it, it's it shouldn't be challenging but it is challenging to like turn on you know switch it on and off you know i mean it's yeah. like because you just you're like well it worked for these guys and these guys are hard chargers so it's got to work for these other guys so but yeah you know, I, it I doesn't always work of- I work with a bunch of first responders now, you know, so yeah, um, they have dangerous jobs as well, you know, right, and right. I want them to go home to their families every night. So, you know, exactly. so sometimes I get carried away and get stupid <laughs> with them, you know, I can totally that. see that too. Yeah, I can my just picture like, it. You cannot talk to people like that. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> I can't help myself. You know, I want, I want them to go home to their families every night. 
So, yeah, I mean, I I think sometimes in those in those heightened uh, situations, you kind of have to sometimes. You know, you got to let you know, get a reality check and be like, "Hey, dude, tighten up." Yep. But some people yeah. get their feelings hurt, though. They yeah. Well, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> and I tell hey. them that. You, you don't yeah, have to exactly. Like, you don't have to like me. <laughs> just have to follow me. You remember we used to, we had a NCOIC that used to tell us that all the time. You don't have to like me. You just have to do what I tell you to. That's right. Okay. Once yeah. you understand that, you're good. Yeah, Roger that. Understand. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we used to hate. I and I I we used to talk about it, and we're like, the reason I don't want to do anything, I don't want to screw up, is because I don't want Jazz to have to say something to me. You know what I mean? It was like, not 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 that you were gonna yell at us, but like I didn't. We didn't want to let you down. You know that was like, man, I don't want to be that guy that's like, you come over and you're like, give me that look or say something to me, like. And then you feel stupid because you know better, you know. So I was, we were always just like, all right, we got to try to do the best, do our best. So, well, you know, the funny thing is, is, I was that same guy, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, same guy when I was young and same guy when I was old. I didn't want to let the, my bosses down or, you know. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah, that's, I think if more people were acted that way, it'd be, they would have a, an easier time, you know, like, yeah. I don't know. But, yeah. Well, you know, it's a different, it's a different world that we were in, you know, for and, sure. And not everybody uh, depends on each other uh, to keep them alive. Like we did. Right. So um, we, we sometimes we're hard on each other, but it was, we're hard on each other because we want each other to, to succeed. Yeah. You know, I, I adopted uh, towards the end of my career was the mantra of, you give everybody the tools to succeed. You set them up for success, you know, um, and do what you can. If they choose not to, then that's on them. But um, you want to give them every tool that they can have to succeed, whether it's knowledge or equipment or whatever. Right. And that's what I hoped I, I tried to do in my career. You should, certainly did. And then some, for sure. Try and set everybody up for success. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I didn't, but uh, hmm. I tried at least. I, I thought you did. I, I mean, I, I, I don't know anybody that, that said different. So, yeah, I think I, that was like I we keep I talk to these other guys about it all the time. And we're like, that was like the best time for all of us, you know, to be in our whole career. You know, being at, there at that time was, you know, like you said, we wouldn't trade it for anybody. It was so fun and rewarding and challenging. You know, it was just such a great time to, to so a great place to serve. Funny. Yeah. It was kind of funny is, so when I got assigned to uh, Fort Campbell, when I had to go to Fort Campbell uh, with the 19th, I was not looking forward to that at all. So when I left, yeah. when I left uh, <clears throat> um, Langley and went to the 19th, I wasn't looking forward to it. Cause you know, I, I had been in Rangers for so long. I was in the 22nd of the uh, SF for so long. I, at that point I had never even gone. Well, I, I I only went from like Korea with a conventional. I volunteered to go for conventional because I thought it would help me make chief, not realizing yeah. that I had already made chief. <laughs> but, Darn it. Um, but, there, but there's good guys everywhere, right? But, for sure. And then, and then sure. so when I got to the 19th, I was just, my expectations were very low um, because mm -hmm. I, because I'd worked with guys like you and all of our other team for so long, my expectations were very high, right? So right. I wasn't expecting anybody to be that good, but. Uh, there was some really awesome young guys in that unit who later on went to Rangers and are silver star winners and big heroes Yeah. Um, that, you know, at the Rangers and, uh, and other units like that, they did amazing things and they were very young airmen when I, when I had gotten there. Um, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you can kind of pick those guys out of the crowd, but I, I look back at some of those guys now, I'm just like, Wow. You know, I, I saw it in him when he was an airman. And I, you know, I, I kind of would tell them, you know, when you when you get a chance, you need to go um, and do something more. Um, yeah, yeah. And they did amazing things. Yeah. Uh, but you know, that's the great thing about the career field now is the standard of training and the standard, uh, you know, what's expected of the guys is so much higher across the board. Yep. You know, it's not like it was so. You know, like when I was young, it was just so vastly different. You know, mm -hmm. it's that I was in, they had high, high expectations for you for training, high expectations for you for physical fitness and things like that. And then there was other units that were not like that at all. Right. But now the board, it's pretty standard. You can probably take 
a guy from most units and and put him at the Rangers and he would succeed, you know? Yeah. Uh, yep. It may not have the same experiences and same training, but he, he can get him. He, but, yeah. Uh, and he can hang physically or, you know, be a good JTAC or, you know. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. when I saw some of those guys that later on did such amazing things in combat with the Rangers and stuff, I was just like, wow, I can't believe, you know, he came, from, you know, he did all that. So. Right. Right. And that's what I hope guys, if someone, if a guy was watching this, that's in now, you know, you need to be that mentor. You got to mentor this because that's the people who are going to replace you. Right. And so that's you right. want to sleep comfortably at night. You want to make sure that you have guys that were just as good as you or better. Um, so take the time to mentor and find those guys that are amazing and push them forward. Yeah. Um, Matt Slyke brought up that same uh, point. You know, he's like, you should leave things way better than you found it. You know, you yes. should be, you know, like, kind of like uh, as if they're your children and you're teaching them to be, you know, upstanding adults someday, you know, like, yeah. same thing you were just saying, you know, that's a, that's yeah, a great you set thing. them up for yeah. success so they can be great leaders. I mean, so right. like that, that young airman, when he was at the 19th, boy, he was, everybody picked on him. He was young. He was, I mean, <laughs> they just gave him a hard time. They were the guys that wrote him like there was no tomorrow, but you know, you could see it in him then, you know? And so it's kind of like try and push him along, you know? And then he did some amazing, amazing things. Um, yeah. And so um, I would encourage everybody to do that. If you're, if you are an NCO and especially a senior NCO, you need to be setting your people up for success. For sure. Uh, one thing I, I can't stand and you I still see it sometimes is uh, uh, supervisors that compete with their subordinates, right? Yeah. Can't compete with them. Stop competing with them, you know, never understood uh, that. You, you need to mentor them and make them better than you. They should right. be better than you when it comes. When, that's your legacy. Your legacy exactly. is my legacy is guys like you. I mean, the amazing things that you guys did, it, it, you know, to me, that is my success. It's not the things that I did, you sure. know, it's not the things that I did in combat and all those things. It's the things that you guys did that to me is my success. Yeah. Because sometimes you do things in combat. You don't even think twice about. Right. You know, like running out in the middle of a firefight to grab a ranger or whatever, you know, things like that. You don't think about those things, but <clears throat> when you get other guys to do it, and they're they do so, so they're so successful at that it that's that's your that should be your legacy yep so, so speaking of that do you want to talk to um do you want to talk about um being the career field manager and like the things that or do you want to talk about um like anything after that as far as like leadership well, advice? Yeah, so the, i know we're uh, kind of just kind of delved dial, into it but the what i at the Pentagon, that was a very challenging job to me just because I didn't really care for that side of the, of, of our business, <coughs> excuse me, just because, um, you know, budgets and having to defend your budget and all that sort of thing and deal with Congress and people who are always trying to steal your money. I spent a lot more time stealing my money and, and then it, it's, we were, because the war was going on and stuff like that, we had, had a tight budget. So I didn't really get to get out as much as some of the other career field managers got to get out. And, and there was a lot of change afoot. Um, a lot of people weren't happy with the change, uh, but that stuff was already starting before I even got there. Yeah. Just like when a two-star general tells me I'm moving your school and you nothing you're going to do about it, you know? So uh, it's, um, it was, it, was, it didn't, come across as very um, job satisfaction for me at the time. Yeah. <clears throat> but then, you know, I had a really good team working with me up there uh, that did a lot of really good stuff and they, they kept my head above water because um, you can get, you can drown pretty quick in a job like that. Um, and they, they did a really good job. I, and I didn't always like every, the direction that we were headed all the time, but you know, um, and just because I looked at everything like a ranger, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? Um, 
And so I, I tried to make some changes while I was up there too. And, and I saw them come to fruition later on, which was good. You know, just reverting back to that, you know, I don't want every guy retiring broken as, you know, battered and beat up as bad as I was by that time. And then, you know, like I said, it was a trend that was happening. We saw by the time your average J tech was a tech sergeant, he was already spent, you know, both physically mm-hmm. and mentally. And so I was trying to put things in place to try and stop that so much. And then um, to me, I saw a lot of inefficiencies uh, again, you know, thinking like a ranger all the time, but I saw a lot of inef- inefficiencies with what we did with our airmen. Um, you know, I tried to model more, you know, there was a time when I was an airman that combat control was very much like TAC P. It was very fragmented. You know, not everybody did all the different mission sets and mm-hmm. um, it was very, very similar to TAC P was, you know, and, and, but they, changed all that you know they got smart and they made everybody the same across the board and mm-hmm. standardized everything they standardized the mission sets standardized their equipment and it paid off greatly for them right so i, I sure. try to use that as a as a model for us as well and try you know t- to me uh, a an airman coming in and just sitting there being a radio operator or whatever it was a waste to me it was a waste of a perfectly good person and the airmen that were coming in were way smarter than when I was coming in. Right. So <laughs> right. And they were, and ones today are way more capable than they were when I was a young kid, you know? So yeah. when I was a young guy, you know, it was a total, total different type of person that was coming into the career field. Mm-hmm. And so you can, and I was trying to convince everybody all the time, you can do so much more with them. They're way more capable of it, but you kind of had a lot of that old guard that, you know, liked it the way it was, didn't want to change things, uh, thought that because I did it this way, they need to do it that way. And yeah, um, very uh, skeptical but, about young guys. And, you know, just, but those young airmen and we're seeing it today now, I mean, they were ready to start training to be a JTAC from the start. So mm-hmm. why waste any training days where you're not trying to guide them towards JTAC, right? Mm-hmm. Being a radio operator is part of being a JTAC, right? You got to know how to use your equipment and your radios and stuff like that. But instead of just teaching them to be just that, and then later on teaching them to be a JTAC, you start that training from day one, right? So it's all, it should be all the same thing. Then you're going to have a JTAC a whole lot faster. Mm -hmm. And everybody was worried about, well, they're not very, they're not going to have the experiences and all that other thing. Well, we didn't either. (laughs) Right. You know, when we started off, we didn't either. Yeah, we might have been a radio operator for three or four years before we became an ETAC. Um, mm-hmm. You were just a radio operator. You know, yep. you got exposed to some casts. You know, when, uh, the funny thing was when I first came in, a list of people weren't allowed to talk on the radio. And only the yeah. officer was. Now <laughs> we don't let the officer anywhere near the radio, right? <laughs> but, um, so it was a different world. You know, if you had a cool officer, he would let you, you know, be a part of that. Um, yeah. but, um, it's a, the, the young guys coming in today are so much better prepared. You know, they're, they're mm. much, so much more tech savvy and things. So then right. learning videos is, is secondhand. Uh, and so I'm, I'm glad that it's changed and where they're be moving, you know, tying the training. That's what I tried to get started back then was tie the two, of the trainings together. They shouldn't, shouldn't be different. You know, yeah. you shouldn't create a radio operator and then create a JTAC. It should be from day one, you're creating the JTAC. They're just getting all that training and it's all building upon itself, you know, mm-hmm. and stuff on itself. And it always seemed like we were hurting for JTACs anyway. So that made sense. Yeah, to yeah exactly. Make, you know, let's just start yeah. making them from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Another yeah. very unpopular decision that I was stuck with was they were starting to cut the force. You know, they, you know, yeah. the military the air force is famous for this. You know, build the force up and then cut it back down. And then, oh, we're like, oh, we overcut it and we've got to build it back up. Well, we were in a cutting stage, right? So they wanted to cut, mm-hmm. but they wanted to cut JTAC positions. They wanted to cut, you know, a, a lot of positions out. And I'm just like, we've got, at that time, we had something like 300 and something positions that had never been filled. Never, yeah. never been filled ever. No, mm-hmm. We couldn't produce, you know, TAC P's fast enough. And so they had that from the day that they were created, they had never been filled. And so I was like, well, why don't we just give up those? All right. Don't 
Don't take away NCOs. Don't take away, you know, you know, these senior airmen and stuff that were JTACs and things like, don't take those positions away. We can't afford to lose those positions because we were still at war. Just take the ones away we right. never filled, you know? Sure. So some people didn't like that decision, but I'd rather lose what? a position that had what? never ever been filled than a position that has a, you know, a JTAC or something. What was their justification for keeping them if we never filled it? It, it because it's all about dollars and things yeah. like that. But the, they were they were, they were going to cut something out of us, you know. So we just had to figure out what they were going to cut. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that seemed like it was the smartest thing for us to do was just let's let's cut positions that have never been filled. That way sure. we don't lose we don't lose anybody. Um, the Air Force gets to save a little bit of money, um, even though those positions weren't filled. They weren't spending the money. They still projected that money every year, right? Like they were going to sure. be filled, right? Um, but uh, so. You know, you get stuck between a rock and a hard place sometimes when you're making the decisions up there. I, I don't ever, I, I don't ever envy a career field manager. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's about money, right? And, yeah. and you got to make decisions, and and then no matter what decision you make, there's going to be somebody that's not going to be happy with you. But yeah. I had a, somebody tell me a long time ago, an NCO tell me a long time ago that. Um, if you're making everybody happy, you're doing something wrong. If you're making everybody mad, you're doing something wrong. You should have probably most people happy with you. And there's always going to be some people that are not going to be happy with what you're doing, no matter what. Always. Yeah. Then you're doing, then you're doing the right thing. <laughs> and so I've always tried to live that way from then on out was, you know, was, I know there's always going to be somebody that's not going to be happy with a decision, but you're trying to do it for the majority of the guys. Sure. But, you know, and so, I, I, I really didn't like being at the Pentagon. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looked, just, like those guys, just like the guy said, you didn't want to be there, but that was the place you, you we needed you there. You know, we yeah. needed you to be up there because you're that yeah. kind of guy. You're the, you had that good mentality. You had a good experience. You know, you're a good leader. So yeah. Being I there was, stayed uh, a little bit longer than I did, but um, I had, the direction that we were being pushed in was not one that I necessarily agreed with in some aspects, some things. And, you know, I, somebody said a long time ago, you'll know when it's time to go, you know? And yeah. I just felt like that was, it was time for me to go. Uh, I hated walking away because you just, you know, I'm sure you felt the same way when it was time for you to retire was yeah. uh, you're, you're leaving your buddies, you're leaving other people behind. But um, as a, as, as another chief, uh, heard one time from a senior officer was there comes a time in everybody's life when it's time to move on. And this is your time. <laughs> <laughs> it was my time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you did, but you're right. You, it, it, it's kind of like an obvious decision, you know, at the time. And it, it yeah. almost seems uh, if you try to force it or if you try to stay too long, it, it just, never works out. So, I mean, yeah. I think you, I got lucky. I got, to, I, got, I got to walk into a job where I got to work for one of our teammates for about a year and a half. Oh yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. 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 I worked for him for about a year and a half. That was a really good job too. I enjoyed that. It just, I was away from home all the time. So that kind of got yeah. old. Um, you know, when you had a long, long career where you're away from home all the time and then you start it's for some people, but I think I just had enough of it. You know, I just, I'm ready, with you. Ready I feel to the same home. way. And so I found another career and I'm about, I'm about to leave it. I'm going to retire again. Nice. How's that feel? Scary. Just like it is when you leave them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're kind of what, you know, what's going to happen, you know, I know. just uh, you know, I, every last military guy feels the same way when it's retirement time. It's like your security yeah. blankets in the way and you're like, Oh, what's going to happen? You know? Yeah. And, and then like, what am I going to do now? Like I, we, cause guys like us seem like we have to do something, you know, keep busy yep. or, you know, yeah. feel like we need to do something to help or, or something, but yeah. Yep. So <laughs> yeah, I got plenty to do though. Um, I'll let my sugar mama take care of me for a while. <laughs> you get your chores to do. do and <laughs> yeah. You gotta, yeah. Around the small, house. small farm. So I got on a, the hacienda. Lot, plenty, a lot of plenty, uh, plenty of things to do. Um, but yeah. um, I've seen, uh, yeah, sometimes Wendy will post those pictures of like your back window or something out of your kitchen. It's just, man, that's a, that's a good looking property. That's really beautiful up there. 
Yeah, you know, when we first bought this place, uh, delivery people would come by or whatever. They're like, well, where do people like you go on vacation? Because this is where we would come <laughs> to go on vacation. Like, well, That's it what is. you could do. You run out like a room or something for like an Airbnb. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Open up a bed and breakfast. Jazz's Ranch. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> I, I've been very blessed since I've, uh, well, you know, my whole career in the military, I've was blessed. I didn't always see it that way at the time. Um, you know, you, 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 sometimes you're blinded by things around you, you know, mm-hmm. um, you can't see the good things for concentrating on the bad things, but, um, I've been very fortunate and continue to be very fortunate. Uh, um, so I can't complain. Yeah. And I'll, you know, I still want to help people and stuff like that too, if I can, you know, and I like sure. the fact that tech P's are always willing to step up and help. Um, and, uh, if, it, if it, and as you know, if any one of our teammates called me tomorrow, I'd be do what I can to help them just like you would. For sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah I didn't, uh, I did, I didn't, I read somewhere where some came out to help out. Like there was a situation in your area that, uh, there was a flooding or what was that? where some guard guys came out to help out. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Bell? Um, well, uh, so when I was still in, or was that somewhere else? No, it was here. It was when I was still in, um, well, there's a couple of times. So when I was still in, we came here to this area a couple of times when they had some serious floods to help clean up. Mm-hmm. One, one time was after some tornadoes. Uh, the first time I did it, uh, was stationed at Campbell. And a bunch of us came down here and helped. It was after some tornadoes, a bunch of tack peas, which was really yeah, yeah. good deal. The second time I was at the Pentagon and some guys came from different units from around and, and helped and stuff like that too. And then um, since I've had this job, we've had, we had a couple of serious natural disasters. One of them being a, a very significant tornado. And we had a lot of guards folks that came um, in and uh, it was really good to work with them. Uh, yeah. The, um, get them to come in and, and, um, help out. Uh, but it, I, I guess, in the, you know, there's one thing that when I was at the Pentagon, I learned a lot about, uh, the guard and how the guard operates and stuff like that. It was one thing that used to drive me nuts because every state was different. Every state had different rules, every state, um, you know, what they could and couldn't do. And, um, when we had that tornado, the guards guys weren't allowed to go on private property. And we're like, well, all the damage is on private property. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, yeah. so that's what people are. <laughs> yeah, you had to get creative on how you could use them and what you could use them for to help out. You know, because they what what they were allowed yeah. to do and what they weren't allowed to do. Um, but I just thought it was kind of silly that they weren't allowed to help on a private property. I'm like, well, yeah, that's where all the destroyed homes and businesses are. That's all private property. You know, very it's little government. bureaucracy sometimes. Yeah, like I know yeah. down. My brother was just down at the border, and he they were kind of saying the same thing. Like the the guard guys can't do the same thing as the border patrol and the border patrol can't do the same thing as the state cops. And it's like, yeah. I mean, aren't we all on the same side? Aren't we can't, you know, yeah. th- there's a job to be done. Let's all do it. Yeah, I don't know. It, well, you know, like everybody's weird. always worried about liability. It's always, yeah, liability. exactly. You know, so I, I understand why for sure, for sure. those rules, but it's not always the smartest way. I don't think, but yeah. But yeah, yeah this, this job I've had was, past uh, eight and a half years, almost nine years has been a really good job, but I've got some really good uh, folks that I work with and um, they've uh, done some amazing things. We've had everything from terrorist attack to, you know, significant uh, um, natural disasters. And uh, we had, uh, when they had the civil unrest, we had that going on for a really long time here. Oh, yeah. uh, and so uh, they're always willing to stand up and do the right thing and keep on pushing on. So nice. I've, always been, I've always been fortunate to have really good people on my team. I mean, I, I don't want to keep stroking you, but you, know, with, you can have as many good people as you want. If you don't have a good leader like you to like tell them what to do, or at least give them some guidance, you know, it might not work out as well. So I'm sure it's well, a, it's a combination of all you guys together with you, you know, it's easy to lead people that are squared away though. <laughs> I know it is. <laughs> My, I ran into that because uh, that's, and we talk about that all the time. Like any, if you held any kind of leadership at the 17th, any, any kind of leadership position, it was, it was, it was, it was cake. Yeah. 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 I mean, the hardest hard part target. about the seventh, the hardest part about 17th is 
dealing with people who are just like you, hard-headed, type A personality <laughs> people. You know, yeah. who are going to butt heads periodically. That's the hardest thing about leaving because otherwise you don't have to do a darn thing because they're just going right. to do it. Right? Yeah. Uh, so that was the <laughs> hardest thing. Now we have a lot of fun, funny things, you know, we did, did to each other or witnessed each other do or. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Those are good things to, to remember. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So have I eaten up too much of your time? Not at all. I could talk to you all night. Uh, I don't, I, I'm, I feel about, I feel bad for keeping you on here. It's gotta be. No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. I'm just, um, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, do you have any, do you want to talk about any kind of advice for people that are, that are trying to get out or, 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 um, well, I would, I would always say to, to get out or, yeah, I would always say to everybody, the same thing I said, you know, what used to bother me a lot was when I'd see guys that were in 17, 18 years and they want to get out. And I'm like, you, you're running a couple of years away from having a retirement for the rest of your life, having medical coverage for the rest of your life. You're not very far away from that at all. And um, you're frozen on me again. Do I still have you there, JD? Did I oh, here you, you go. So you start. You got cut off at. Um, you said uh, people that have only been in like a like they've been yeah, in like for eighteen years. And they decided to get years, out. Years. They they want to get out. And we saw we saw some of our peers do the exact same thing. Right? They got out of, yeah. so close to retirement. Um, and my advice to them always was the same thing. If you're going to get out, make sure you got something good lined up. Um, really because yeah. you're, throwing, you're throwing away a whole lifetime of of income. You're throwing a whole lifetime away of medical care. Um, so, and then don't ever make that decision when you're angry. <laughs> if I got out every time I was angry, I'd have been out 20 times. Over those, <laughs> you know, yeah. All that time that I was in, I would have been out many, many times. Yeah. And I'm glad I never did, you know? Yeah, um, for sure. And then don't ever make those decisions when you're angry about something or, because it'll be a foolish decision. I mean, I think every last yeah. one of those guys that got out um, before they hit their at least 20 regretted it. And, I, and when I was at the Pentagon, I would have a lot of guys that would, were contacting me trying to get back in. Um, but the problem was, is they were too old then. Right. They, you know, they, when they got out, they were over the age that you were to be able to come back in. And so yeah. I, I couldn't let them back in if I wanted to. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it was I just saw it over and over and over again. So I would just say to everybody, you know, even if you only do four years, it's awesome. You served your country. You did. Sure. You know, um, and I and I and I respect you and I appreciate you. But if you are a guy that is pushing 10 years to just go just finish it up. I mean, there's going to be times when you're not going to be happy. There's going to be times when you're not, you know, going to be satisfied with where you are or what you're doing or whatever, but um, it makes a huge difference. I see now on the outside, you know, the insurance that we have, the steady income. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be able to retire again from this other job right now if I didn't have that steady income from my retirement. Um, so uh, it, it makes a world of difference. And, and, if everybody always thinks, well, I won't have all this crap on the outside. Yes, you will. <laughs> Every last one of us that got a job on the outside, you know, after we retired, right? Yes, the outside is just as a pain in the butt as being in the military. You know, it's yeah, just and sometimes even more so because, yeah. like you were saying, like at least you're in the military, you got three hots and a cot, and you got a, yeah. you know, you, you're you got medical. You don't have to, you don't worry, have to worry about. about yeah. yeah, you don't have to worry you, about if things you get a, that you have to worry about on the outside. Exactly. Am gonna, yeah. Am I going to have a job tomorrow? You know, am I, you know, am I going to get, you know, laid off or fired or whatever? You're not going to get that in the military. Right. Uh, exactly. And they take care of the family in the military too. You know, so that's right. It's a good deal. That's why I don't understand why they're having such recruiting issues right now. But I, I do understand part of it because volunteerism across the board is down. And we see that with our volunteer fire departments on local levels all the time. It's just a lot of people aren't volunteering for things, but military you're getting paid for it um but it's security i mean you that's a secure job um right yeah and, I, and like i was uh, we were talking about the other day i can't remember who i was talking to but you know these kids that um they 
they go to college right out of high school. They don't really know, or they either go to college right out of high school and can't afford it and run up a bunch of debt, or they mm-hmm. don't know what they want to do and they kind of just mill about for a couple of years. It's like, man, get in the get in the military, go get your you know college money or your GI Bill, set yourself mm-hmm. up for success. I mean, I I, I just don't understand. I, I think there's this uh, maybe like a stigma around it, like, well, I don't want to be marched around or have to go to combat, or and I'm like. I mean, people a very are telling you to do a chance. civilian job too. Yeah, civilian job. They're telling you what to do too. You know. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and as far as worried about going to combat, I mean, guys like us had to volunteer a couple different times to even get to that position to be in harm's way. Or you know, there's I know there's plenty of people out there that will never be in harm's way. But, you know, yeah, you, there's, you get there's a lot of military. Way. When I was at the Pentagon, there was people that officers that had been there their whole career never left the Pentagon. At the Pentagon. Yeah, how can you do that? You went, you came here as a lieutenant and you're a colonel and you never left the Pentagon. I mean, they just had that job, you know, they had that, that yeah. niche, that certain job, but I, I, a lot of people don't realize there's a lot of people in the military that don't ever go to combat. Right. So, and even if they, even if they deploy, it's more related to some, you know, it's so far behind an enemy line or some sort yeah. that there's no danger really. You know? yeah, and it's not, it's not bad at all. And then the military offers, I mean, a lot. Yeah. So that's why I don't ever understand. I, I do have guys periodically, they'll ask me to talk to their kids about joining the military and stuff like that. And I try to tell them the same thing because you know, I'll hear that same thing all the time. Well, I don't want to be told what to do all the time with this and that. And like, you're, you're told what to do anyway. You go to any job, they're going to tell you what exactly. to do. You know, right. the, the problem with that is it's a whole lot easier for them to fire you and get rid of you. And, you know, yeah. The, the military yeah, I mean, is once you... a lot harder to do that. For sure. Um, yeah. And you but, learn a skill, if not multiple skills, you know, yeah. for free. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, I can I, always, I, these days, and I'm sure you're the same way. You can be in the group of civilians. You can pick out who the military people were. Yeah. Yeah. I sure. just, I just ran into that same thing. Um, two nights ago, we were um, collecting food um, for our local food bank. It's kind of thing we were doing with the community. And there was a gentleman there and, the, just his demeanor. He was an older guy. I'm like, yeah. you were in the military, weren't you? <laughs> so my, my coworkers were like, how do you pick them out like that? I said, it's, it's the way they hold themselves. It's the way they are. You know, they they talk to you, you know, the, the, you know, all those things that you can tell. Yeah. Person it's obvious. Speaking. Yeah. It's obvious. Um, it's, they've got a, they've got an aura about them that, that, you know, stands out whether right. you try and hide it or not <laughs> it's gonna stand out and some do <laughs> some are like you know some try to blend in but we're you know yeah they'll they'll say something you know that only we would say or you know yeah. have an opinion that only we would have or maybe some dark well, humor that you know that <laughs> maybe or it's just the, the level of respect that they have for other people you know but that, also that too right right and so yeah. you know um the military work, you know, I always tell people that the military is just a microcosm of society, you know, so it's, right. it reflects society. It's just on a smaller level. And mm-hmm. so you, you learn to work with every type of person in the military mm-hmm. right, you deal with. Um, yeah. Whether you like them or not, you learn to work with them. You have to, you don't have a choice. Right. Um, so I don't always see that's that. A, that's on- the best thing about the military. That's what I love the most about it. It's like, it, there is no, um, uh, you know, you can't, if you, they just tell you how to act, you know, you can't do certain things. And if you do, you're going to yeah. get rung up for it. You know, that's, yeah. that's the best I mean, thing about it. Everyone's but, on the level playing field and yeah. But, but for folks that stay in for a long time, that just becomes a way of life. Right. So, right. I, you know, and I can, and to this day, I can work with anybody. I don't have mm-hmm. to like them. Yeah, right. I can work with you and we're going to work together as a team and we're going to be, you know, we're going to do everything we can to be successful. And, but you don't see that across the board. I think that's more of a military thing. You learn to work with people, even if you don't like them. Right. Yeah. (laughs) You put those emotions aside and you're like, there's a mission and you're there to do a job. Period. Right. Right. So I, I, I respect that. Uh, And you can, that's why another, another reason why you can always kind of figure out military people is because they, they're willing to be with, you know, work with anybody or, you know, yeah. to do what they got to do because you put all that stuff aside you know mm-hmm. yeah 
and you get the and job just, done. Then it's work. Yeah. No. Now we'd rather get the job done than have it bogged down by some petty BS or something. Stuff. You know. Yeah. And yeah. so, unfortunately, people that haven't been in the military don't always have those skills. Yeah. And they get bogged <laughs> down. They get bogged down by the silliness. Yep. Yeah. Get sidetracked and they get their feelings hurt or something or yeah. Or or they are they you know a lot of drama create a lot of drama. I know. Not that there's not some drama in the military once in a while, but at the there end of the day, we we put it aside. To yeah, it it's usually yeah, but that's the bottom line is when it, when it's time to go to work, you go to work and you do what you got. Right. Do, right. Yep. And whether you were mad at the guy next to you the day before, today we got we got this to do, and this is what we're going to do. Right. Period. And so that that's the difference. Yeah. Is to me, and I, that's why I would always try and push people. Um, young folks into going in the military, even if it's just for a short period of time, even if you just do one stint, I mean, what you're going to learn from the military is just going to be phenomenal. The education. That for you're sure. gonna get. Yeah. And, yep. and, and you're going to take that with you for the rest of your life. Yeah. And yeah, the, exactly. The, you, you, now you have that base, you have that, that foundation that now just the sky's the limit. You can do whatever yeah. you want after that. Yeah. I mean, and it, it's going to make a difference and employers can see that too. I mean, for sure. Um, the job I have now, I mean, I, I didn't come from that background. I work with a bunch of firefighters and stuff, you know, and, you know, we work with law enforcement and firefighters and, and, uh, m- and medics and things like that. And I didn't come from that world. Um, right. But um, somebody was dumb enough to hire me and they saw <laughs> that, <laughs> I guess they saw that what you, what you really get in the military is leadership skills. Even mm-hmm. if you weren't the leader, you get leadership skills and it's, Yep. Military spends a lot of money training their folks to be good leaders and managers um, that mm-hmm. your average civilian doesn't get. You know, so you stand out. Sure. You stand out in the workforce in the civilian world. So even if you do just a short period of time, you're going to take those skills throughout the rest of your life. Yeah. And it's going to pay off. And employers appreciate it. Well, like you were saying, I mean, even if you're not in that leadership position, you're still being led by these good leaders. Yeah. So that those, those, it, it's almost inherently instilled into you that those principles, you know. So even your you bad can, leaders in the military are better than a lot of leaders outside. <laughs> yeah. Um, so because they got that training, at least at a minimum, they got that training. Yeah. So my, I wasn't very happy with my very first supervisor in the military, but. Um, when I first joined, you know, it was a lot of guys that were came, joined right after Vietnam. And uh, you uh-huh. know, after Vietnam, there was a mass exodus of people from the military. There's some people that stayed, there were Vietnam veterans that stayed in. And then there was ones that joined after Vietnam when um, the skill set required was not <laughs> the same. Right, right. Yeah. So my very first supervisor, I wasn't very happy with him. I saw other guys had really good supervisors and I didn't, but um, I ended up that actually frustrating. I actually outranked my first supervisor by the time he retired. Nice. I, I outranked him. <laughs> um, and that's, I mean, I'm not trying to brag, but that's just, you know. Well, I don't think it's a brag. It's, it just shows, it kind of shows how that do how little, you know, how poorly that guy was or how, you know, how his he, didn't, he didn't get a good, he didn't get really good training. There was that time frame. It was the late seventies, you know, they, yeah. the military was suffering. There was military was having a hard time at that time, you know, cause post Vietnam was right, a stigma right. about being in the military. Yeah. Um, but, um, that was one, that's one thing I'm really happy about was all the training that I got as far as leadership training, uh, management training, things like that throughout my For career. Sure. They're very smart on that. Yeah. It pays off. Definitely pays off when you get out. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, and yeah, it's obviously, I mean, obviously I've learned a, a ton of most of my stuff from you guys like you guys like Kenny, you know, um, Bruce, you know, those guys that they were just, the, I, we were, we're us, us at that time had a, just a slew of, of good leaders, you know, yourself included, obviously. And uh, yeah. And I think that kind of speaks to that unit, you know, we all kind of just pass it on to each other. You know what I mean? Like you guys passed it down to me and I passed it on to 
you know, Kevin and Mark and Maddie, and they pass it on to their guys. And, and, I, and I think <clears throat> kind of like you said before, Matt said, that's, that makes that unit just better and better. And I think just the unit too, but the career field in general, because there's a lot of guys that get out of the unit and they pass that knowledge on to people. And I, I, like you said, I mean, the career field is, <clears throat> I think head and shoulders from when you and I were in, you know, yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, uh, what was great about our group to me was I learned just as much from you all as you guys say that you learned from me. I say the same you know, thing, man. And there's some guys and, and I'll put you in this same group of guys that I actually learned how to be a man from, I may have taught them how to be a good JTAC or whatever, a good uh, military person, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. But they taught me how to be a man. So people like you and some of the other guys on our team, I learned how to be a good man, a good father, a good person, you know, which I didn't, yeah. I didn't, have those, I didn't have those skills. So it was a two way street for me. And I, and I would venture to say that if we had some of the other guys that you just mentioned that were our really good leaders, they're probably going to say the exact same thing. We all learned from each other. Yeah, for sure. Um, you guys taught me just as much as I may have taught you which wouldn't be very much. So I, you guys probably <laughs> <don't> know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'll learn almost everything from you. <laughs> uh, you know, so, I mean, that's, I, I honestly, you know, respect you all more than uh, you can ever imagine. Just not just because of your successes in the military, your successes as a JTAG, your successes in combat and things like that, but your successes at life um, as a whole. Um, is that, you know, I learned from that. Um, and I try to apply those things to my life today. Uh, well, it's nice of you to say, man. I mean, we, I think, yeah, that two way street is always open. You know what I mean? We always just like, I, I think it's impossible to go into a unit like that and not just grow, you know what I mean? In some way, I think. And, and going back to advice for guys that are in today and stuff like that, you got to remember that too. You, you, you're not Mr. Know-it-all and everything else. And some of the, some of the guys that are under your charge, some of the folks that are under your charge may actually, if you allow them to, might teach you a thing or two. If nothing For else, sure. how to be a better person, you know? Yeah. Or well, that's kind of what I talked to some guys about that the other day. I was like, um, I, I used to hate it when the best thing about you, and I keep mentioning you and Kenny because you guys are instrumental, but every time we went to the range, anytime we went anywhere and did anything, we always had like a little mini AAR and we talked about, you know, how everybody did. And I used to, <clears throat> after that, I used to get upset when I'd go out with some other guys and I wouldn't hear any feedback. Yeah. I'm like, there's no way I did this perfectly. Were you guys not paying attention? I want to give me some of that, you know, yeah. that hard feedback that I used to get from jazz, you know, like that was the best, that was the best learning is getting kind of your feelings hurt a little bit about what you've jacked up, you know? So, so when I, I went to the, when I went to the 19th, that was a, that was hard for some guys to take from me and, but I, but I wanted it from them too, you know, sure. cause we, cause we, we actually thrived on that and we improved, we improved ourselves because we did that. We were, we course, would, yeah. we would let each other know. Cause um, you know, just like when you're writing a, a, a paragraph or something, you read it 10,000 times and not see the mistake that you made. Right. And somebody else reads it and they go, yep. dude, you misspelled spelling. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, but, but exactly. you, you run it right the whole time, right? So if you're if you're controlling aircraft the same way, and no one ever corrects you when when you're making a mistake or something, you think you're doing a perfect job. And so exactly, I, I really like the fact that we would critique each other. I oh, loved it, and because um, you, you'd be better at that. Well, I, I could tell you that not everybody was that way, and so I, you know, <laughs> um, they didn't necessarily. <laughs> Yeah, like I, don't, I don't get it. I, I don't understand that thin skin, you know, it's like you would, yeah. it's like, why would you not want to be better? You know, not everybody, but not everybody embraced that or came up the way we did, you know, where, yeah. uh, where we just, we forced it on each other. So you learn to appreciate it. Right. And so yeah. not everybody had that experience. Yeah. Um, and, and when you hit them later on in their career and you, and then you try and do that with them, they, they're just not receptive to it. Yeah. But like they take it personally, you know, yeah. which is, the last thing you should do. You know? Yeah. Like, I'm yeah. not trying to, I'm not trying to, under, I'm not trying to undercut your character. I'm just telling you, Hey, you screwed this up and 
I, do it a different way next time. A lot of them, once you once they realize that you were only doing it to to make them better at what they were doing, um, and, and, and that, kind of I'm not trying to say that my way is the best way. You're just saying this is what I see, and mm-hmm. so can you learn? Can you learn from it? Because you may not see it, right? So right, but not everybody's receptive to that. So I, no. I did get, I got some resistance from some folks at the 19th that did not appreciate that uh, approach, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, and I was just trying to set them up for success. You know, I went exactly. back to that, that, that leadership guidance that I had gotten early on was, you know, set people up for success, you know, do what right. you got to do to set them up for success. So, um, and, that's, and some, well, some people misconstrue that as, uh, you know, always, uh, treating the, like, I don't want to say being nice or, you know, sometimes setting you up for success means telling you, you did something wrong and you need to exactly. understand, you know, you know what I mean? You can't just keep patting everybody on the back. That's not setting someone up for success. So no. you get, you know, you have to the good and the that's, bad. It's uh, just appeasing them and, and pleasing them. Um, when you're setting right. somebody up for success, you're, you're doing what it takes to make sure they succeed. And that may Correct. be something that, that may be something that they don't like. Um, and, and it often is. I mean, that's, that's kind of the point, you know, like, yeah. And I, I still find myself in that position now with some of the folks that are on my team. Um, they may not like what I am doing with them or, or, uh, or what direction I'm taking them, but I'm trying to set them up for success. You know, I'm trying to show right. them, you know, a, a way to, su- to success, to see, mm-hmm. to see put, set, put them on that path. So, but, you know, military microcosm of the society. So there's plenty of people out here and outside of the military that, you know, just don't receive things like that very well. They, they, yeah. they observe it as a threat on them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there are people out there that are, you know, you know, we had them in the military too. They, uh, we called them the badge protectors or whatever, the ones that <laughs> right. did not want you to succeed because they wanted to be the one, the only ones to succeed. Yeah. There's, you know, there's plenty of those people out here too, but um, I try to let them know right up front, you know, you know, I, I want you to do good. Right. That's my, that's my legacy. And I, and I would hope every NCO that would watch this right now, that should be their legacy. Is you want your people to do good because when they do good, that reflects on you. Right. Exactly. It's like, you don't have to work so hard to highlight yourself. You will be recognized for making your troops great. You know, you're, you're going to do, you're going to do well, but if they, if it's even better, if you're, if you're the commander or your boss or whoever sees that your guys are just crushing yeah. and that reflects, yeah. that reflects great, you know, awesome on you for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Little do they know that, you know, there's guys like me that were probably the dumbest guy in the room. You just had such great guys. They made you look really good. I don't know. I don't know. You keep saying that, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. So I, I I still try to lead that way right now. Um, and even after I retire again here soon, I'll miss I'll miss it, of course. For sure. Um, I'm I'm ready to move on for another stage of my life. But um, now my wife is going to have to be the person I mentor all the time. Which, <laughs> I'm sure she's looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm sure she's going to be really happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> All you guys that are out there that are married, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to That's a you can't. Now that's one situation where you have to really watch what you say. <laughs> you know, they yeah. they're never receptive that's to that hardcore uh, feedback. You know, like we you know, used to give each and, other. And that's that's the bad thing. You know, it goes back to like I told you, my boss often tells me you can't talk to people that way. <laughs> right. So sometimes I talk to my wife the same way and then I, afterwards I'm, I'm my behavior is corrected very quickly. We'll say that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> like whoops. My bad. Sorry about uh, that. <laughs> Sorry. Can't take the military out of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean anything by it. It's just the way I am, you know. No, don't take yeah. it personally. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it usually starts off with a look. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, oh yeah, I just screwed up. But oh yeah, yeah, you know it immediately. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> try to backpedal a little bit. Yeah. yeah. But what but, I meant was, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I meant to say was. <laughs> 
whatever it was that was not the opposite of what you have to yeah. do. Well, when you, you get it old enough, like, you know, me, I just, I'll just walk away. Then I'm just like, okay, I can't, I can't fix this right now. So <laughs> yeah. Just let this blow I'm, over. I'm just going to dig yeah. that hole deeper and <laughs> yeah. start shoveling dirt in on myself. So just right. Right. Walk away. Come back later. Yeah. Hope every, just give it, is everything okay? And you know, I just give it a quick, yeah. is everybody calm down now? Yeah. So do you have any, um, do you have anything that you're like extra things you're working on? Like any, um, and it, I don't know. I, some people have like things they want to bring up or some that they want to pitch or, you know, something that just to bring to some people's attention. Do you have anything like that other than, you know, the, I don't know, like personal stuff or, um, you know, like charities or any kind of, uh, <clears throat> um, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, uh, like any kind of, um, yeah, so, I mean, everything that I'm working with here is all local stuff for the most part. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I hope I get an opportunity to continue to support those things, um, on a local level. Uh, but you know, as you know, I've got a, um, special needs adult child. And, um, mm -hmm. so, um, that will eat up a lot of my time, uh, yep. which is okay with me. I'm ready for that. Uh, sure. but, um, that's mainly the reason why I've chosen this time in my life to uh, go ahead and retire, retire so I can, um, uh, be a better caretaker for her. Um, because it's, you know, my wife's got a really good job. She's doing really well. Um, mm -hmm. and she's very successful and, uh, um, I want her to, I want her to do good. You know, she put her life on hold for a long time for me. You know, we know that, um, you know, our, yeah. our spouses put them, put themselves on hold a lot of times, or they're constantly, they're not moving forward where they could have been if they were with somebody else, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but so, she's doing awesomely. So, um, I think it's my turn to, um, take care of things at home and I'm, I'm going to embrace that. And it's, you know, I will look, it's not a job, but I will look at it as, you know, my new job, keep me busy every sure, day. Sure. Yeah. Um, taking care of those things, taking care of things here on the farm and, and taking care of her. That'll keep me pretty occupied. Um, do you have any, um, any advice or any guidance for people that are kind of in your situation that may have somebody at home that, and there might be people out there that don't aren't as good at it as you, or maybe struggle with, do you have any, like, what is, what's helped you to kind of, you know, make the best of the situation? Um, well, you know, um, so uh, in my particular situation, I married into that situation. Right. So sure. it was a very new, it was new uh, for me, but um, I have, I have learned a lot from her. I mean, she's just taught me so much about, life and, and appreciating life and things like that. But, um, I would always tell people to, uh, find and seek out when you're, when you're young uh, and you have a, a special needs or functional needs child or somebody that you're taking you could, these days, it could be your parents or a brother or, you know, a sister or somebody like that too. Um, when you're taking, seek out other people that are the same thing, cause they may have some very good advice for you. Um, and then just don't take no for an answer. Right. <laughs> just keep, cause you're the advocate for that person. You know, they can't advocate for themselves. You know, they mm -hmm. can't, uh, they can't be an advocate for themselves. So you have to be an advocate for them. So, uh, you just keep finding until you get the right answer. And, and that's even true sometimes with, uh, you know, TRICARE afterwards, you know, sometimes it's difficult to uh, get certain things uh, taken care of, but it, it's not that they don't want to. You just have to find the right way to approach it um, when it comes to, uh, in, and that's true for any insurance, I would say, probably. You just have to find the right way to approach it. There are, and and I would say our insurance is much more receptive to um, making sure that family members are taken care of than other insurance companies are that I see yeah, for sure. Um, so I, you know, I, I see, you know, in the civilian world, some insurance companies that, that first thing out of their mouth is always no, you know? Um, and, and so when it comes to the military insurance, it's not always that they want to say no, 
you, you just have to find the right approach that fits within the parameters or whatever that, you know, they're trying to do. They want to say yes, but they just have to make sure it falls in those right parameters. Sure. I got a very smart wife that knows that stuff, but so I would always, you know, say, seek out other people that are like you because they may have some very good advice for you. Um, and, and then just trying to be that best caretaker that you can be for that person, because again, they, they need you, you know, yeah. God gives that, you know, I, I like to believe that God gives, uh, uh, individuals like that, the right parents, it's not always true as uh -huh. we see that all the time. We see some really bad parents. Um, but, uh, I was put in that, I was put in this position, uh, for a reason and I'm going to try and be the most successful one I can be. Uh, so I think it's my turn, um, to, uh, to, uh, be that caretaker. So, um, that's what I'm doing. Well, of course, well, my wife. Good hands, man. Go my, ahead. My wife's accusing me of setting us up for making the job easier. So, um, <laughs> so I, yeah, I work bought, smarter, not harder. Okay, yeah, exactly. So that's not the Ranger way, though. <laughs> <laughs> not always. Not always. <laughs> she, always she always does that to me all the time. She goes, "We're not doing it the Ranger way. We're going to do it the smarter way." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to be like, the smart Ranger, not the not the strong Harvard, Ranger. Harder, not smarter. Yeah. Um, but so uh, I recently bought a Roomba. Um, I know that nice. sounds silly, but um, she's not like, at all. Oh. She's like, sure. I had a vacuum every other day. And now you're going to have a machine do it. <laughs> yeah. So you're retiring and you're going to have to do this stuff now. Now you're buying all the robots and everything. <laughs> yeah, yes. you got it. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you're tracking. <laughs> if I can find a robot to do dishes and other things like that, I'm certainly going to find one. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, so I'm I'm new stage. We'll see how it works. We'll see how long it lasts. Well, I talked to my brother about that too. It was like it, it, he was struggling with should he go back to school or should his wife go back to school? And he fell on the decision for his wife to go. Yeah, because he's retired, you know. And I was like, yeah, it's it's their time to you know. We, they've, like you said earlier, they've done so much, they've sacrificed so much so we could do what we wanted to do. You know, yep. it's time for them to, you know, it's time for them to shine, time for them to get there, to do what they're going to do. Yeah. And she's been very successful. She's done an awesome job. And uh, I certainly wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to take that away from her. For sure. But, and that's, that's another thing, you know, for guys, for folks that are in the military still, you know, that might be watching this or whatever, is don't forget that. You know, don't forget that uh, they're struggling too. I mean, there's times when I come home and I'd be like, you know, I got to deal with the stuff over here in combat and I also got to deal with the stuff at home. I can't do both, you know. Right. Some people, it's hard, but you got to look at it from their angle too, you know. They're, mm -hmm. they're sacrificing a lot too. They're, they don't yep. have you there. Uh, and so. Doing it all alone, yeah. Doing it all alone. And, um, and if you remember, uh, my wife, I mean, she walked into, I was already senior leader at the 17th, remember? And she walked in cold turkey to that, you know, and then you got that yep. expect, expectations from a senior leader's spouse and what, right. you know, what they're supposed to do. So uh, that's she, a huge responsibility for sure. Yeah, you don't yeah. realize that, you know, and then, and then you're gone all the time. You're either deployed or you're training somewhere. You're gone all the time. You just kind of leave them there. So mm -hmm. it's just something to think about, you know, just remember that um, to build it, you know, to keep that strong relationship going, which mm -hmm. I didn't always have when I was in the military, you know, I've same. Yeah. So, um, but once you finally find that one that you can have a good, strong relationship with, just remember that, you know, they're making sacrifices yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Respect them and, you know, you know, be thankful for their sacrifice as well, or they're even, they're just their hard work for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Yep. So, but yeah, that's mostly what I would I recommend to people when I talk to them, and uh, you know, I, I periodically run into uh, tech peas and stuff, and hit up. And we had recently there was a guy that lived uh, 
maybe about an hour and a half from me. I didn't know him when I was in. Right? We never crossed paths, but he was attacked. P and he passed away. So um, me thinking there wasn't any other tack peas nearby here, I went ahead and went, but tack, I, I got there and there was tack peas that came from all over the world to, to be at that guy's funeral. You know, he had been out yeah. for a long time, um, which I thought was awesome. Yeah, you know, it is. Guys are going to do that. You know, I thought for sure that I might be the only one that shows up there, but I thought we'd better have some type of representation there. So well, I would also for going. Yeah. I would push that out to guys too is, you know, at least kind of stay a little attuned in everybody. Um, my wife does that for me. <laughs> this job I have right now keeps me really busy. Um, right. So she, she keeps me in tune with what's going on with folks, but you know, because they might need you, they might not know you and they might not realize they need you, but they, they do need you, you know, whether it's getting right. them through a family emergency or um, through a funeral or something like that. And then, um, one thing I also like about our guys, the network is, you know, so if somebody called me tonight and said, Hey, we got a tack P that is, you know, he might be borderline suicidal or he's having some really bad issues and he lives close to you, you know, I'm going to go. Sure. You know, I might not know that guy, but we did the same thing and that resonates a lot, you know? Yeah. So I've worked with a few veterans um and that that makes a difference so just keep that in mind you know somebody else might be having a really hard time but they're going to respond to you because you've been in the same type of things that they've been in right you share the same experiences you got the same kind of mentality yeah and they may not respond to anybody else and you may make the difference in their life to turn them or you know turn the situation around yeah so it's just something to think about don't don't hesitate to do it because you may make the difference. So, I mean, if somebody called on me tomorrow, you know, I'm going to do my best to get there and do what I got to do. Sure. But, and, yep. you know, like I said, you know, we all, we, you know, we know guys that are struggling, mm-hmm. you know, that are having a hard time. Um, we try and help them get through it. Hopefully that we're successful. Um, We've in our community, we've had guys that did give up, you know? Yeah. And that's always a bad thing. It's, it's sad that they get to the point where they just give up. Yeah. And take, and and take it, a lot. Yeah. And it's, it, it, you just wonder like, could I, could I have reached out or could some, you know, it, it sucks yeah. that you feel well, helpless. You know, you it, feel it'll like, give you the opportunity to reach out, you know? Yeah. And, and so, um, uh, if you're one of those guys, you know, reach out, you know, reach out to one of your old buddies or something, because sometimes it just takes like a, a, a message or a yeah, text or something. You just, you know, just say something to the guy like, Hey dude, it's all right. Or yep. yeah. something simple. Yeah. You know, I've, I've done that a few times with some of our buddies, you know, that, that needed it. And I would be there again for them tomorrow if they needed it as well. But, um, yeah. It's because we, we were there. We did the same things, you know? Yeah. Um, but. And some guys just want, some guys feel lonely and they feel like they don't have anybody. Yep. And just knowing that we're all in it together yeah. it helps them through it. You know what yeah. I mean? It, because it, it just, it's not that we don't have those same thoughts and issues sometimes. We just learned how to deal with it. Right. We right. just learn yeah. how to move on with your life and live your life as best as you can because there was guys who didn't get that chance. Right. So mm-hmm. you owe it to them to live your life as best as you can. Uh, right. And so you don't squander the life that you've earned the life that you were given. Cause I'm mm-hmm. telling you, if, if you went to combat and you came back alive, you were given a gift. Believe right? it. Believe <laughs> and so it. A lot of the situations that we were all in, we were given a gift. Yeah. And, I, mean, I should have died so many times. Even in training, I should have died so many training times. Training for sure, yeah. <laughs> so, and that's kind of the way I look at it. It's like I, like I went over there. You, you do these horrendous things, or you've seen this, these horrendous things, and but now we're back, and I feel, yeah. I feel relieved. I feel like empowered. You know, I feel like and, happy and, that you know, we made it. Thing, bad things happen to guys that are, are with you, you know, or next mm-hmm. to you, or right there with you, and it for wasn't sure. you. 
and it wasn't you, right? So yeah. you were given a gift. Don't squander that gift. And that's yeah. what don't I don't think of it like why me? Why not me? Think of it yeah, like why, think yeah. think thank why God did, it wasn't me. Why did I get to survive, and yeah. they didn't? Well, it's you did get to survive. You yeah. and and they didn't. And so don't waste that life that you were given, right? Because it wasn't you, right? And, and frankly, that's just best. combat. I mean, that's just the way it yeah. is. I mean, yeah, some guy, you know, it's just live the best life that you can live because they didn't get a chance to. That's right. That's my do it for them. For like that. And so guys that are struggling with that and don't want to let go and don't want to move forward. Um, you owe it to the guys that you left behind for sure to get past that and live a good life. Enjoy life. Enjoy what you got right. left. You know? Yep. For sure. And that's right. that's not saying that you won't have bad days. Oh, of know, course. You're going to have some bad days. You're always going to have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just like everybody else, there's certain days of the year that, you know, it's just like, uh, this is going to be a bad day, you know, just because yeah. something that happened, you know, uh, yeah. but that's okay. You know, you just press on. It's okay to have a bad day. It's okay to have bad um, periods, you know, short periods. Just don't let it drag mm -hmm. you down right. and give up. Because then, And then maybe if you know those, those days are coming, you know, arm yourself, you know, emotionally and, you yeah. know, deal with them as best you can. Well, and some, have a buddy help you. you right. Know, Reach sometimes, out. sometimes it helps just to talk to a friend. You know, sure. you don't even want to talk about the bad stuff. You just yeah. talk. You know, and that helps yep. sometimes too. So just don't hesitate to reach out. I got a, you know, we, uh, a friend that I was at the 22nd with and, uh, and, um, and we worked together and stuff like that. And he really struggles. He's, and I, and I, there goes long periods of time when I can't even get a hold of him. You know, I just want to keep track with him and stuff like that. You know, I want to follow up with him because I want to make sure he's okay. For sure. You know, and, um, because and I and I wish that he would just get to the you know realize you were given a gift. Yeah. Don't waste it. Yeah. So I don't want to get too deep. We can't get <laughs> too deep. <laughs> nah, it's good. I mean, I think people need to hear it. You know, I think I I hope that if, if people hear this, then it kind of you know gives them some ideas on how to deal with it you know and kind of say yeah. oh yeah i guess i can reach out to people because i mean maybe somebody's hesitant maybe they're you know they we are kind of you know macho or whatever and you know sometimes they yeah. we, we these feelings get the better of us but we don't want to let anybody know what it does so yeah they don't yeah that's true. And, and i i'm the same way and you know, the same thing happens to me sometimes you know i get um i get down i start thinking about stupid crap that's happened you know but yeah. you just gotta you gotta pick yourself up and go about that. You know, something else somebody told me a long time ago that I try to remember too, is I can't change anything that's happened in the past. That's right. Can't change any of it. I can't even change what I just said. You know, right. that's gone. It's gone. It's past. The only thing I can yep. change is the future. Right. So that's, right. Um, that's I, why, why worry or concentrate on things that happened in the past? Exactly. I can't do a darn thing about it. And the only way I can fix anything that's happened in the past is by doing different things in the future. <laughs> right. Learn from so those mistakes. Concentrate on the, the next future time. and not the past. Yeah. yeah. Some of our friends, and they just won't let go of that past. Yeah. Um, I'm just like, well, you can't change that. You can't do anything about it. You know? No. Nope. But they just, you know, I, it's getting them to take that step and just start living and stop right um stop dying <laughs> does that make sense yeah. yeah for sure that's what you're doing you're just dying you're just prolonging it just waiting it. around just running yeah. around for it to happen yeah yep yeah so yeah just start i think living. yeah just if, if guys just let themselves off the hook I yeah it'd feel a lot better you know just give yourself yep. a pass you know just be a little vulnerable sometimes it's easier said than done for some folks for sure. Um, but for sure, you know, you can't, you can't live until you stop living for the past or whatever. You can't, you know, you can't move forward. Right. So, yeah. You got to stop dwelling. And, and, and the bottom line is, and I've told this to one of our buddies once is uh, <clears throat> you're not, you are not uh, honoring 
the guys that you left behind by dwelling on those days. Right. You know, you can't yeah, change think about it. them. Yeah. Think about those guys instead of sometimes we I'm have a saying, tendency to yeah, think about ourselves too them. much. I'm not saying forget them. You know, I'm not mm-hmm. saying, you know, don't not, but you're not honoring them by, by sitting there and just remember, you know, not moving past that day or whatever. Sure. Or those days. Yep. You're just staying there all the time. You're not honoring their, their sacrifice that they made. Right. So, but hopefully, hopefully I, I, I pray that uh, someday some of those folks do get to that point where they can just move on with their lives and enjoy their life. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. I hope they have the courage, like the strength to, and it is kind of, it's stronger. I feel it's a stronger, you are stronger if you can reach out, you know, as opposed to, you know, some guys think it's, you know, it's a strength to keep it all bottled up inside and not say anything, but man, uh, it takes a lot of guts to, to reach out and admit when you're down and, you know, seek help. So. And, and be honest with you, sometimes you don't even have to talk about being down. Like I said, just, you just talk to a buddy and you, Talk, I like to talk about the funny things. You know, that's why we talked about funny things here this evening and stuff. I like to talk For about, sure. we got plenty of them, you know. I've, yeah, plenty. You know? <laughs> <laughs> plenty of dumb things we've done. Plenty of dumb yeah, things. Yeah. I've, plenty of dumb things I've done. You know, I can tell stories all day long about. I got See, this of, thing, but you're in the unique position that you, I don't necessarily know all the dumb stuff you've done, but you've seen all my dumb stuff firsthand. <laughs> Well, I've done a lot of dumb stuff with you, so that's true. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and then uh, I would also make sure that other piece of advice I would give guys is take care of yourselves. You know, don't let yourself become me. And that's one thing I tried to point out when I was at the Pentagon was when I talked to groups and stuff like that. Don't be me. Take care of yourself. You know, yeah. if you're broken, get fixed. Go to the dog. Really get, really get fixed. Don't, you know, don't let your shoulders get dislocated six times in one day because you're running the course and then don't take care of it. You know, <laughs> right. And then don't let your guys pull your arms out of your socket. Cause you're going to be a guy like this someday that can't lift your arm any higher than that. You know? So yeah, yeah. just be smart. Yeah. And even now, I mean, it's even smarter to, or it's even kind of tougher to be able to endure the stuff that we did, but, but not sustain the injuries we did. You know what I mean? There, like get yourself in a position, get yourself in the shape where that stuff doesn't affect you as negatively as it affected us. Like we didn't prepare properly for those road marches or those jumps, but now they're doing the exercises and the nutrition and the, you know, stretching or whatever it is, they're preparing for those things. So they don't sustain the same injury. They're being a lot smarter about it now than we were. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not doing 10,000 pushups at once or, Right, uh, having a crunching contest or something stupid like that. <laughs> yeah, only crunches this uh, this PT <laughs> sessions. Like what? That's all we're gonna do. What we're gonna? I know, I know. Yanking yeah, on our well, necks for twenty years, you know, doing sit ups. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's just you know it's just but they're they're a lot smarter about it today. But oh, for even sure. still, um, you know, guys still get injured. You know, it's just part of the business. It's inherently dangerous. So right. you're gonna you're gonna get injuries just. Remember to take care of it. Take the time to stop, let it heal, and then move on. Yeah. That's another thing. The docs used to get mad at us for you're like, oh, you got a, you have an injury. And then what what have you been doing for it? Nothing. You know, I just Nothing. kept going, doing stuff. They're like, Well, you gotta rest it, otherwise it's gonna stay injured, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. I never thought about that. So you'll remember a certain basketball game when a certain one of our teammates uh shoved me and uh Bent my knee the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, you know what? <laughs> those sporting events we used to do. Mark Foster was just talking about when he dis- he broke his leg or dislocated it or something. You had that happen. We played like water polo with polo tennis balls with, and almost drowned a couple officers that well, day. We, we used to also play with full bottles of gallon jugs of water, old milk <laughs> yeah. jugs. Full of water and throw those at each other in the, in the pool. Um, yeah. But so, you know, I ended up having, I think, about four or five surgeries on that knee before I got it replaced. Oh and my God. Now I can't hardly bend it. So um, don't be stupid and just take the time to let something heal. 
Yeah, yeah for sure. I think I was <laughs> back to jumping within like two or three months after having my knee bent the wrong direction. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> We could tell stories about that individual all day long because he was yeah. he was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. one, t- one time we should probably get on here with all of us and just like tell oh, those stories. Oh lord, just, yeah. that would be <laughs> maybe not even be, release it. Just like <laughs> just, just, yeah, just that would be over. <laughs> if you did release it, you might make some money off of that because it would be yeah. hilarious. Little snippets all, <laughs> all the time. We'd be we'd be memes all the time, memes. We'd be memes all the time, right? Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Podcast all over the place. Look at these idiots. Yeah, exactly. Don't <laughs> be these guys. <laughs> so, all right. Well, we've been on here for three hours. Wow. Yikes! All right. Well, hey you. man, thanks a lot for doing this. I I really appreciate it. It's yeah. been I, it was way too long between us talking, and I it was great catching up with you. I mean, I, I, like I, I said, I it. I learned so much from you, and uh, you're one of my strongest, you know, leadership mentoring figures in my career, and I I owe a lot to you, and I I can't thank you enough for everything you did for me, man. I really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, and I I do definitely appreciate talking to you and, and catching up, and um, I would like to do that more. And especially now that I'll be retiring, I'll have more time to be able to do that sort of thing. My job right now keeps yeah, me right busy, but, but um, yeah, but I, again, I'm, I'm not kidding when I say I, I've learned just as much from you as you think you learned from me. Um, but I, you know, so, and, and it's more about how to be a man than anything else, which is a very important lesson. Um, yeah. So I appreciate you. So, um, but yeah, so great. And and if anybody uh, actually takes the time to actually watch this, mm-hmm. first of all, get a life because you're going to be very. <laughs> <laughs> it's just two old guys. BS <laughs> listening to me, you know. <laughs> now, if I was your mentor, you got very low you, people skills. You, know, you, get, you can figure out what it is that you're doing wrong. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so, but yeah, by all means, if, if, if somebody thinks that I can help them contact me, cause I'll try for sure. Same here. Yep. Same here. Like reach out to us. If you, if you feel lost or lonely or, you know, uh, whatever it is, man, we're, we're here for everybody. So yep. for sure. So yeah, for sure. But yeah, it's been awesome. Appreciate you. Appreciate yeah, what man. you're doing. Um, and I, I, I do miss the guys and I, I would definitely participate in a group discussion, but <laughs> it would probably get very ugly very quickly. <laughs> Hopefully that'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. For sure. <laughs> but all right, brother. Um, it's good right, to talk Jess. to you. And, yeah, uh, you too. I hope, uh, hope you uh, are doing good. Your family's doing good and um, everything's Same. going awesome for you. Yep. All good. For, for everybody else out here with the board enough to watch this for three hours and seven minutes, <laughs> eight minutes. I hope, uh, hope everything's going well for you. If it's not, let us know how we can help you succeed. Definitely. Yeah. All right, brother. All right, man. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye. All right. See you. <laughs>